Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everyone to the, what, ninth episode of the Jams and Tea podcast Where through. we okay. spin the jams and spill the tea and today we uh, we are here. We are down one member. Tragically, Morgan is not feeling very well today, so he had to opt out on this episode. But I assure you, we have four people with the enthusiasm of five, and maybe even then some. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Heck yes. is oh, yes. like. So let's uh, jump in then to what we've been listening to. Um, we'll mm-hmm. go in. We'll, we shall we go in our normal jams jammed. Order to no no just just today just today <laughs> yes so uh, Jake do you want to kick us off I I will kick us off um I have been listening to to quite a few things this week but I have mainly uh served in I I've gone further down the Tom Waits rabbit hole and I have mm-hmm. listened to several of his records. Um, a couple of which I'm I'm trying to build up to his more lauded ones. I still haven't listened to Swordfish Trombone or Rain Dogs or like mm-hmm. some of the like eighties stuff. I kind of skipped right to the nineties after Tyler recommended me Bone Machine, which is one of the things I listened to this week. Um, but I also I did go back and listen to Blue Valentine, also because of Tyler tweeting about mm-hmm. Kentucky Avenue, uh, yeah. which is easily like top five Tom Waits songs. Yeah. Uh, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's For it's it, an amazing song. Yeah. Uh, it's, like, it's amazing. And, Obviously sad. Just, yeah. oh my really, God. Yeah, it's really great. I still do from the album prefer... So it was my first Tom Waits and I fell in love with it. Yeah, Christmas card from Hooker. The, the great thing about those two songs is like the real like uh, signifier of, of Tom's storytelling skill is the way that he withholds information. Yes. Um, Especially on Kentucky Avenue. Well, both you songs, you fill but, in yeah, the blanks. It, it really yeah. like hits the moment, hard. The song. moment in Christmas Card where she reveals what her life is actually like, it's just devastating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's one of the things I love about Tom's works thus far is that his ability to be a storyteller and embody characters and environments so well is his biggest strength so far. Mm. Um, and I did discover two of his records specifically that I've developed a strong affinity for. Um, one of which is his least popular and least critically acclaimed release, uh, that being The Black Rider. And The Black Rider is interesting because this album is actually a sort of co... It, it, it's a, a piece that coincides with a play that Tom Waits wrote with uh, playwright William S. Burroughs. And oh, fuck. the play is partially based off the fact that William S. Burroughs once got drunk when he was an alcoholic and tried to reenact the mm-hmm. William Tell myth and shot his wife and mm-hmm. killed her. Yeah. The, Having read the, several of William S. Burroughs's uh, semi-autobiographical novels, mm. um, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, for those who don't, he wrote Naked Lunch. He wrote the book of Naked yeah, Lunch. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Which, the, as the you would expect... Of... Oh, the film David oh, Cronenberg. Just quick note on Naked Lunch, which the film of which is kind of based on, mm-hmm. but that's all. Yeah, yes. I mean, there's also this amazing book he wrote called Junkie, which is much more uh, autobiographical and about actually being an addict, which is great. I'm actually mm-hmm. going to read um, the Black Rider just because it caught my interest so much, but the. Uh, the album is just the the songs that are meant to do for the Tom wrote for the play, and yeah. it's this bizarre hellish carnival setting of a that, that story. Sounds, that sounds like Tom Waits, all right. It, it really does, <laughs> and even without the backstory of knowing the play or anything about it, it was so enrapturing and and vivid and weird, and it has some of his most out there production. And I just, I really love it. I listened to it like four times this week. It was oh, nice. immediately arresting and cool. And I was like, wow, I guess this is my favorite. And then, then I listened to Tom Waits, I believe 2003 album, Real Gone. And Real Gone, to quote Tyler on an earlier episode of this podcast when he talked about the first Metallica album, holy shit, it's fucks. 
It's so good. It's so good. I don't hear anyone talk about this fucking album. And I listen to this and it is the apex of everything I've listened to him like before. Like it's got pieces of, of Bone Machine, of, of Blood Money, which I also listen to, which is fucking great, of like of meal variations. And it is fantastic. It is wild. It is fucking some of the craziest, most out there shit he's done, but also some of the most sincere. One of the two like album closing songs, um, I think it's called The Day After Tomorrow, is just one of the most heartbreaking things he's ever written. The entire album is like front to back perfect. I love it. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it to wow. death. Is that it's your favorite uh, Tom Waits so far, is it? Uh, yes. So far wow. that is my favorite of his. See, um I haven't I heard um, it. I haven't heard Black just, Rider or Real Gone, but as I'll ooh. touch on briefly when I talk, uh, I'm going mm. back through his discography in order to fill in the gaps because I've listened to the, I listened to the big ones, but I missed a lot of the littler ones. So mm. I'm excited to get to those albums like I've missed that you yeah. seem to be mm. in love with. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, glad I, I started with this era my, too. Yeah, I just added it to my Spotify queue, which is like Good. 400 songs long at this point. And I, yeah. oh. at, no, just because I keep being like, ah, I want to check out that album. Let's add it to the queue. Uh, and then it's just that and that. So I have yeah, a, like, a 20 album long Spotify queue at the moment. Including I mean, it of, happens. I'm the same way. Yeah, including a lot of jazz, actually, because I was interacting with someone on Twitter who was like, no one talks about jazz. And I was like, right, I need to correct this. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it doesn't help that all jazz albums are like 90 minutes. Also, mm-hmm. let me just rattle off all, because I know I'm probably running out of time. I'll okay. just we we, talk, we the... talked over a lot of that, so. Yeah, yeah, it's no. fine. So just I'll, rattle off I'll, everything yeah. else. But Bullets it's it's mostly stage. Tom Waits. I've listened to a bunch of his albums. I listened to Mule Variations over again. I listened to Blood Money, which I fucking loved. Um, I listened to Real Gone. I listened to that. Um, I listened to Blue Valentine. All great albums. Uh, I listened. To, I re-listened to the last Proto Martyr album in preparation for this week's episode, which I love. Great album. Uh, I listened to Taylor Swift's new release, Folklore, which I will keep my thoughts uh, guarded on because that is going to be next week's episode of this podcast. Uh, I listened to The Hotelier's Goodness for the first time, and I will keep my thoughts on that uh, closed, because that is going to be, uh, te- actually, that's technically the next episode of this podcast. <laughs> Tyler, praying at the altar of Hotelier, as you should. Uh, re-listened to Ockerville Rivers, Don't Fall in Love with Everyone You Meet Again. Uh, I listened to Clipping's Riggle EP, which is fantastic. Ooh. Great collection of songs. Uh, the fucking opener, uh, uh, Shoot 'em is like fucking it's so catchy and good. Uh, I knew, let's I knew see. you'd like that song in particular. I just, I just knew you'd like that it's, song. Oh, in it's such a fucking jam, man. Uh, right, that's, oh, uh, and... that's a whole minute right there. Mm. Shut up, August. Let him talk. <laughs> Fine. Uh, We've also well, I mean... listened to a new <laughs> vinyl of yours, I believe. Yes, uh, I got a vinyl from Sersha uh, that is Stephen Wilson's "The Raven Who Refused to Sing," which is one of his solo efforts. Uh, one of his more well-regarded and well-regarded by me personally. Uh, a fantastic progressive rock album. The Mellotron on that album that was used uh, was the Mellotron that King Crimson used in in the Court of the Crimson King because Stephen Wilson is a nerd, and of course he did that. <laughs> Uh, and it's a terrific album, and all his masters sound absolutely delicious on vinyl. I would highly recommend that. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Sersha. It is an that, that incredible is, um, album. That is the next Stephen Wilson album in my chronological progression that I have to get to, so I might do that in the next week, maybe. I think you will dig that. Um, I re-listened to Jeff Buckley's Grace twice, because that's the most perfect rock rec- rock album Rest ever recorded. Christ Rest in peace, Christ. Rest in peace. Buckley. Uh, I listened to the Punisher of Phoebe Bridger. <coughs> I listened to, I re-listened to So Jealous by Tegan and Sarah, my favorite Tegan Sarah record. I fucking adore that album. Great album. Uh, I re-listened to Motorhead's Aftershock, which is one of their more recent, uh, like, 2000s albums, which is still fucking awesome. They Motorhead is a supremely, like, I think, at least in modern circles, they're a bit taken for granted, discography-wise. Uh, Every Against Me record, because of our episode, um, I listened to... Uh, Porcupine Tree Sphere of a Blank Planet again, just because I wanted to. That is an album that sounds like it is from the perspective of someone who is permanently in the sunken place from Get Out. Uh, and I listened to uh, Winter's Gate by Insomnium. And if you don't know who Insomnium is, if you like Opeth, for the love of God, check them out. They're prog death metal, kind of melodic death metal group, and they I... are fucking outstanding i knew the moment you said the name insomnia like exactly what this band was gonna be isn't it and, yeah 
and yeah, that's that. That is pretty much it. Other than the stuff I've been uh, listening to for this podcast yeah. specifically. But right. yeah, that's we'll, it. We'll just call that Morgan's time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I feel Why like not? Steve Wilson using the Mellotron from King Crimson is like the film school I just graduated from with with a first. Um, they have the dolly um, from. They're the sorry. Um, the steady cam. I think it's a big fucker, but they have the the setup basically that was used on The Shining, and they oh. let no one use it. Oh God, no! Because film equipment breaks all the goddamn time. I wouldn't let anyone within like five feet of it. No, I understand, but it's like it's there. It's it's a piece of film equipment, and no one uses it. <laughs> August, what have you been listening to? All right, what I've been listening to this week. First off, uh, Homogenic by Bjork. Ooh, ah, the second uh, best Bjork album, in my opinion. Mm, I really <laughs> like it. And it's my first exposure to her. I figured it might be a good place to rip the it's, bandage off. It's totally <laughs> the most uh, August core Bjork album. Like, it was my favorite. <laughs> it was the first album. I listened to as well. It's my been my. It's not my favorite Bjork album currently. Vesper Teen's overtaken it, but it, it, yeah. in terms of like, because I've been listening to Bjork since I was a little kid, because my dad loves her music. Um, Homogenic was my favorite for longer than Vesper Teen has been. So it's like a classic album, right. um, super influential on like Radiohead and like a lot of the big bands at that time. Amazing. Yeah, I I totally see it. It's a fantastic album. Uh, moving on to settle a debate of this podcast, I've been listening. I've been going to, through the first two Nas albums. I will have a Ooh. verdict. <laughs> I'll have a verdict for you next week. How about? Uh, okay. Then I would like to revisit to them so I can contribute. Me too. All right. I was uh, really. I listened to the first Judas Priest, not first, the uh, British Steel by Judas Priest. Oh, interesting. What do you think? A uh, fun album. I think if you think that's a bad album, you're a boring person because you don't like fun. I mean, I mean Judas a, Priest are, they, they have consistently just been a fun ass band their entire I, career. I, I don't like fun. I think they're kind of a mediocre band, <laughs> personally. There you not, go. I'm not oh, a big fan of their stuff. Oh, that was a oh, Sersha joke if I have oh, ever heard I one in my respect life. respect that so much. I personally, so I, I, like, I like Jack Antonoff's work with Bleachers a little bit more. But even then, I'm not a big fan of them being either. The so. Janelle Monáe feature on We Are Young is all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, continuing on with continuing on with this week, uh, "Bloody Kisses" by Typo Negative, a band my dad uh, turned me on to, and that Morgan is apparently a pretty. He think he, he said, is. "quote It kicks ass," and mm-hmm. yeah, that album kicks ass. Goth it's maybe metal. a bit mm, gothic metal. It's maybe a bit too long at like seventy five minutes, but the great tracks there make it worth that listen. I listened to two Metallica albums, self-titled, The Black Album, and Load. I'll save my thoughts on those for uh, maybe some upcoming event. Telos, Telos by Nicholas Jar, his new project, which I will keep my thoughts close to me on in the event we cover it, but if we don't... Uh, We'll be able to talk about it at some point as well. Uh, I'd like to talk about it too, even if it's just in the intro segment. Yeah, and uh, finally, an album that's grown on me and grown on me, and I'm finally to the point where I I think I love it. Well, I do love it at this point, and it's an (laughs) album I didn't get for the longest time. That is New Order's Power, Corruption, and Lies, an album that's solid. Pretty awesome. Yes. Pretty good. I mean, it's a good yeah, album. That's very good. That's my week. Fantastic. Uh, right, so you're so that's up. me, I so suppose. Yep. Right. I mean, um, in the last few days, I've been listening to a lot of my um, vinyl pickups. Um, because like when I get paid, I tend to order a bunch of vinyls, and then it takes like three weeks for them to arrive. So yeah, anyway. Um, so that's Punisher by Phoebe Bridges, Song for Our Daughter by Laura Marling, and All Her West Texas by the Mountain Goats. 
which are three albums I just adore so much. I've also got an atrocity exhibition by Danny Brown, which I've been yet to listen to. But um, from what I, I, I've heard, like the first three songs in the mix is really crisp. Mm, um, that's good. Yeah, and I've listened to a whole bunch more albums. Outside of that, uh, I have two have listened to uh, Relatives in Descent by Proto Martha and Blue Valentine by Tom Waits. Um, I've also listened to the entirety of Biffy Clyro's discography. Oh yeah, years. that's been an odyssey on Music Board. <laughs> yeah, vastly uh, differential ratings because there are some albums in the, there are a lot of albums I hadn't listened to basically. Because uh, I got on board with them right after Only Revolutions had been released, so I listened to all of that. Um, and I listened to the album that came after it, um, and then it looked like the albums they released after that weren't as good, so we didn't listen to them. So it's been a lot of discovery, um, but I'm going to get into my thoughts more in upcoming content um, that we're going to be branching out into. Um, I don't know if it's going to be the first of that type of thing that we're going to do, but it might be. Mm. Um, I also listened to Confield by Orteca, um, which I loved. It was my first Orteca, um, and Tyler said it was Tyler. Like, <laughs> don't start here. Um, but it was... Keep talking. You're right, Tyler. You're right, Tyler. Keep talking. You good? These no, are, I loved these it. Are, I loved these it. are good words. Okay, I loved it too. Yeah, no, Tyler was like, when I told him I was going to start with Confield, it was like, bad idea, but I loved it. So... What, what do you want to get from that? I also listened to all the other records that were in the poll we're doing. So I listened to Spiderland by Slint. Ooh, which, yeah. What did good, you good. Oh, I love that so much. Oh, it's nice. so good. Um, I listened to uh, the first Beth album. So we're talking about their other album today. Um, and I, th I think about the same of that that I think about Jump Rope Gazers, but for different reasons. Um, and I'm going to get into that later. And I also listened to two other Bruce Springsteen albums in prep for Tunnel of Love. I listened to Nebraska. Um, and I listened to Born in the USA. It's going to be such um, a fun discussion. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, it's um, absolutely I, going to be. I was lukewarm on both. I don't really have strong opinions about either album. Um, I will say this. A lot of my reasons for, in general, not liking Bruce Springsteen are there on both records. But on both records, there were songs that I really, really loved anyway. Um, talking about Highway Patrolman, I'm talking about Dancing in the Dark. Um, yeah, um, and I'm going to save my thoughts about Tunnel of Love until we get to it. Yeah. I listened to um, the Soundgarden album that's in our poll. Loved that. And Motorfinger? To... Yeah. Um, I listened to McCluskey's um, My Pain and Sadness is More Sad and Painful Than Yours. Uh, amazing kind of out there punk record. Um, if you like Idols, I think you'll really dig this. Yeah. Speaking of Idols, I listened to their first album, Brutalism, which is Ooh, not yeah. as good as Joy. It's not as good as Joy, but it's really good. Um, yes. I listened to Ghost Meliora. Um, mm. And I have to say... Um, in return for sending Jake the vinyl of uh, the, oh, yeah. the, the Raven, Jake sent me a ghost double single of Kiss the Go Ghosts and Mary on the Cross. And both of those songs are better than anything on Meliora, which is a shame. That is a but bold take, and I respect it. But it's still a very good record. It's like a, I'd say it's like a seven. Um, yeah, and I listened to uh, Brandy Carley's album Give Up the Ghost. I'm excited to listen to a later album because it won a bunch of Grammys um, and I love that kind of music. Uh, I, I listened to uh, a Cry Wank record um, for, a band with that, for a band with that name. They make very somber, compelling, emotional sort of indie folk. Um, they have a song on their record. Or a band Tomorrow with that like... name. <laughs> yeah. As if you'd expect um, anything else from a band called Cry Wank. <laughs> Cry Wank. Yeah, I mean, look. Um, but they have a song called Song for a Guilty Sadist, which is like top tier sad core music. Love um, that title. Yeah, it's really, really good. And I listen to some rap songs by Earl Sweatshirt, which I love. <gasps> right. Yay! Um, Fucking adore uh, that album. So yeah, I listen to it because I listened to it because I saw Jake rated it like a 10 on Music Board. So I listened to it and um, I loved it. 
I, it took me a while to fully click with that one, to be honest, but like, I don't know, something about it unlocked it in my head. This and seems like, to, wow, this, this is what be... sounding, like, this is what depression sounds like. Yeah. This seems yeah. to be a theme with me, right? Like, I, albums that people have taken a long time to get on board with, I'm just like, no, that's good shit. Like, first yeah, You're ahead of the curve. Or, or the inverse. So, Sosha, I want to ask you, because I noticed you logged another one of my favorite albums on Music Board. Um, you didn't mm-hmm. write a review uh, for the Twilight Sands mm-hmm. debut. And I want right, to yes. know what you think about that album. Um, well, look, the thing is, I accidentally queued up some of the deluxe edition songs, um, and I didn't realize it was transitioning out of the album into the right. songs. So, um, yeah. so I think my appreciation of it was detracted by the fact that I felt like those inclusions made it feel a bit baggy, even if that's a detraction yeah. the album doesn't deserve. Um, yeah, but, the original was just nine songs. Yeah, I felt like I want to re-listen to it and appreciate it with just those nine songs. Um, but That's fair. That's totally fair. Is, for, I liked, for the record, yeah. I will say, um, just as a bit of context, it's probably, like, it's their most acclaimed record, but it's also, in a lot of ways, their least immediate one because uh, a lot of the arrangements are just caked in this shoegazy guitar sound yeah. that very much like the melodies are kind of buried beneath that. And it's an aesthetic that mm-hmm. if you don't listen to a lot of it, it can be kind of like a little jarring at first because sure. it's really like guitar intensity. Whereas on their, mm-hmm. on their subsequent records, they strip a lot of that back and they're more melodically focused. Um, mm-hmm. So it may be I mean, that that look, sound like, is I... just not something that mm-hmm. is amazingly like gri- gripping to you. <laughs> Um, sure. And the, in which case, I would recommend their later records where the, the noise is stripped back a bit in favor of a more um, uh, poppy sort of like the band that their later stuff gets compared to a lot is The Cure. And that's because they're mm-hmm. Robert Smith's favorite band. Um, huh. Yeah, he's <laughs> On like, brand. They've opened yeah. for um, uh, The Cure or like Robert Smith uh, has opened for them or something ooh. like a bunch of times. Could you imagine opening for The Cure? Like, yeah. God wow. bless. Well, if you listen to a record like um, the, either of the last two Twilight Sad records, they basically mm-hmm. sound like the Cure records, except Scottish and somehow sadder. I mean, I, that is a brand I appreciate. <laughs> oh, also, I almost forgot to mention, Tyler, I also listened to my first Autocar album. I listened to Amber and I loved it. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for shouting that out. Yeah. 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 Two very different Orteca records doing the rounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amber and Confield, worlds apart in terms of sound. So that's quite cool that they're both getting shouted out. Um, right. So did you have any other records you wanted to shout out, Sosha? Um, I was pretty much done, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was going to say, we should move on to okay, Tyler. Sweet. What did you so, listen um, to this week? I'll try and like, you know, go through it as quickly as I can, but I did listen to quite a lot. Uh, I'll start with the re-listens. So, uh, this is not like a new thing, but pretty much every day I listen to Ortega. <laughs> like, I'm very on brand. I do that pretty I'm much every day. I'm fucking shocked. No, no, no. But like, I mean, for a, a lot of people, you know, you have your favorite band, but, and you love them, but maybe you don't listen to them all the time. And like, and that's not like any, to take anything away from them. But the thing with Ortega is just that I do literally listen to them every day because they have so much material that's so varied that i can never get sick of them because if i'm sick of one particular aspect of the sound i'll just listen to a different era record because they never made the same record twice um they, every record sounds different to the other records in a certain way some of them sound similar especially in the early era but um from like their fourth album onwards every album is notably distinctly different from the other ones um so anyway i've been doing that a lot and the reason why i'm shouting it out is because i'm gonna be prepping uh, a sort of like a worst to best Orteker um, video where I kind of explore their discography at length. Um, and yeah, that was why I listened to the all of the Biffy albums yeah. that I hinted at because I'm doing that for them. Both yeah, because, Scottish. Because there are some artists, right, that are just like have discographies that are too unwieldy for us to kind of like, or for me to sure. expect like a bunch of people on this podcast to want to like really sink their teeth into, except for maybe August. Um, so yeah. um, as an excuse to um, get a lot of my thoughts on this band like out there and like why I love this so- music that is so understandably abstract and esoteric to a lot of people uh, to try and hopefully make that a little bit more accessible. I'm going to work on this uh, worst to best video, which I'm very excited to do. Um, but anyway, another record I re-listened to uh, is Charlie XCX's How I'm Feeling Now. I hadn't listened to that record um, for a while and I came back to it and I love that record even more than I did when we reviewed it. Uh, it's, um, I think, the best pop record of the year. It's remarkably consistent. I'm not going to say too much about it because I've already reviewed it and most of my points in my review still stand. I just 
happen to love it more now. Um, so it will be interesting to see where that turns up on my year end list because it will undeniably be there. In terms of new listens, uh, I listened to uh, a live album from Coil. So um, the reason why I got into Coil initially, I've spoken about this on another episode, but like uh, Zach, our friend, mutual friend Zach recommended Coil mm-hmm. to me. Uh, and he recommended specifically their live album and the ambulance died in his arms, which was recorded a few months before um, the front man slash lead singer of Coil committed suicide um, and the band basically ended. Uh, and so what I was doing is Zach said that live album was one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. And so that was like the tipping point. It's like, okay, I wanted to get into Coil. So I'm going to go through the discography and eventually end up at this ultimate statement this live album that is basically the not the last thing they released but probably the last thing they recorded um and yeah i listened to it in the middle of the night because that's in in total darkness because that is the only way to listen to the music of coil genuinely like without trying to be pretentious it, you're the whole experience of coil is robbed if you're not listening to it in total darkness you can only um, listen to bon Iver in michigan you can only listen to the Jesse Ware album if you are in a dance club with well, half a pint of beer. This is even you. more extreme a case than that because I don't think you only can listen to Jesse Ware in a, in a club, but I think you can only I listen know, to Coil in the dark. Um, anyway, because like two of their albums are literally called Music to Play in the Dark. But but anyway, this album, this live album, holy shit, what an emotional fucking draining experience it is. Like totally minimal, just an hour of their minimal electronic heartbreaking minor key melodies repeated in this these tr- mantras that that john balance um repeats about like oh it's just unbelievably good um easily the best um statement from them in any form um incredible live album one of the 10 best live albums i've ever heard easily um sensational stuff uh i also listened to uh, I listened to, on the recommendation of our mutual friend Spencer, I listened to um, New Wave Act Oingo Boingo, uh, specifically, oh, uh, specifically their most beloved record, Dead Man's Party. And I want to yeah. say, for anyone who doesn't know, is that Oingo record. Boingo is the band that Danny Elfman, Danny Elfman. was in before yes. he became a TV movie composer. And so it's his band. He was the front man of this band. Uh, and Dead Man's Party is an amazing album. It's as good as the best uh, Talking Heads records or the or, or not quite as good as the best XTC records for me, but it's right up there. Uh, it's just... Title nine. track, man. Whew, it's shit just goes like, hard. It's just like basically they decided let's make um, nine of the best New Wave songs that have ever been made and let's just put them on an album. And they did that. There's no filler. There's no weak tracks. August, you would love this album if you haven't heard it. I suspect you might. I, I have heard. I've heard a lot of the singles off of yeah. that album, and I just really need to hear it. In full yeah, yeah, yeah. The full experience really is just so good. It's a fucking fantastic record. I'm so grateful that Spencer pushed me to listen to it. Uh, I listened to, as I already talked about, I listened to Blue Valentine, which I actually think is a is a uneven record. Like the highs are really high, but it also I agree. Uh, kind of and and a lot of tom's 70s records have this problem where the there there, there is amazing like all-time great songs but there's also a lot of stuff on them that just doesn't really work and the midsection of this record in particular kind of drags it down a bit Um, but it starts and finishes pretty strong uh i listened to ween's quebec so i've obviously Uh. um, i've obviously waxed lyrical about how my appreciation for Wayne and I tweeted the other day that I think that they're better than the Beatles uh, which is obviously a bit of a meme tweet but it's relevant because um, they are a very similar band to the Beatles in a lot of respects like they have uh, in terms of like coming within the boundaries of their own respected eras they, they come at their music with a similar sense of irreverence as well as ambition as well as just not take well actually no the Beatles kind of arguably did take themselves pretty seriously towards the end whereas we never did Ween always had a sense of self-awareness and a sense of um, relishing and poking fun at themselves and the image that they create and the kind of iconography and stuff of the music that they're enamored with. Like they're incredibly self-aware, incredibly intelligent band that nonetheless makes music that doesn't sound intelligent. It's music that's very immediate. It's music that's very uh, emotional. It's music that's very meaningful. Uh, and it's music that's very well arranged, even even when they're being like when it, when they're at their most kind of childish and and um, silly. Um, 
yeah and quebec is um arguably like one of their masterpieces it's up there with the mollusk i don't even know whether i prefer the mollusk or quebec um but they're both like twin peaks of the discography um uh, and i have, have <laughs> added i have added the mollusk to our recommended records lineup for a couple mu- a few months time i'm going to say this now so that i don't end up switching it out because i really want us to talk about that record um, mm. I think it'll be really fun for you guys to listen to that and discover that record. I'm gonna amazing surprises. Um, I'm gonna interject briefly just to say, like, uh, wrap it up because I've given you the. It's all right. I'm 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 two totally and a half aware. minutes. I'm totally aware. Uh, all right. Uh, I've not got many more I want to talk about. So obviously, I listened to the Taylor Swift album. I'm not going to say a word about it, other than to say that it sounds uh, like a national record, except without the national yep. drummer. Um, so so take take from that what you will. Uh, I listened to Opeth's My Arms, Your Hearse, which is, um, so I've heard Orchid, Morning Rise, Deliverance, Damnation, and now this. So I started with Deliverance and Damnation. Now I'm going back and listening in order. And I will say that so far, this is my favorite Opeth album. Good pick. Uh, by, Good pick. I don't want to say by a large margin because I like the Deliverance Damnation duo, but this is like really, I think, coming off the back of those first two albums before it, I think this is really where they kind of hit the mark and their 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 Thank songwriting you. is more immediate it's more consistent it's more cohesive uh the arrangements are brilliant for like the first half of this record it was like a solid 10 like it was literally a 10 towards the end I, the songs aren't quite as phenomenal but they're still really 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 good so it ended up being like a really strong nine uh, amazing record so good uh, you're I on listened- the best run of albums i think any band has ever had now that you got to that record so i'm excited yeah so yeah fantastic uh so i'm looking forward to listening to still life next which i know is jake's favorite uh, second second favorite oh okay uh, and one more record i want to shout out that i listened to was um a very underrated not a major record but uh it's called it's miles davis uh album miles in the sky so this was miles's first fusion album the first album where he um attempted to make jazz fusion it's not particularly well known because it's more of a transitional record between um the the big uh post-bop quintet stuff like uh, sorcerer nefertiti and miles smiles and then the real fusion classics like in a silent way bitches view brew and fields to kilimanjaro so this was a transitional record but i wanted to shout it out because it's um compared to miles other big period stuff it's not as uh well it's not as as often heard but it's really 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 good uh tony williams drumming is fucking out of this world this dude was so young when he joined the quintet and he was drumming and he stole the show like we were having a conversation a while back about the greatest rock slash metal drummers and Mm. i genuinely think that tony williams even though he's a jazz drummer and his drumming is so propulsive so impressive so outlandish so incredible that it would be up there with the greatest drummers of all time like neil mm-hmm. peart and all those guys it's just a different nice. style of drumming it's not as yeah. it's not drumming in the context of rock or metal it's drumming in the context of rock influenced uh jazz and it's just he's so sensational i wanted to shout it out obviously there was though that, that whole and, and he never so... had he never had a chair thrown at his head in order to I was thinking of Whiplash like the entire yeah. time. I was yeah, just yeah, like, yeah, exactly, exactly. Zach's videos. It's wild to me. Like, obviously, Whiplash is kind of more enamored with an earlier period of jazz. But, yeah. but Tony Williams, from my money, is the greatest jazz drummer that I've heard. Um, anyway, that's my week, basically, in, in music, <laughs> aside from what we're going to be talking about. Mm-hmm. So it's, good. it's a good week. Very, I think we've all had pretty yeah. good weeks in music, we TBA. Yeah, really. I would all of you recommend you check out that Crow Rank record though. It's really good and sad boy music. Mm. I mean that's our brand. Sad boy music. Totally. Um okay, so shall we move on to our, our reviews then? And which is uh, first, yes. Beth's or Proto Proto Martyr is first. Uh, Martyr. We, have, yeah, yeah. we have the headline so, um... act within our reviews and then we have the <laughs> then we have the supporting one. Um, yeah, so I will introduce the best because I asked we review yeah, the sure. record. And um, Tyler, I think you're the most familiar with Proto Martyr, I would say. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I can have you introduce them. So Proto Martyr are. Um, I I read in an interview that um, Joe Casey doesn't really like the the subject on the label post punk. So I'm going to try and mm-hmm. avoid um, using <laughs> that, even though I think that in terms of the context of the mm-hmm. music, this sounds like in the last ten years, it is a post punk. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it's yeah, it's fun record, like. But I suppose there are also elements of art rock in the same uh, sort of sense. There's a band like Parquet Courts as well, even if uh, mm-hmm. this band are a little bit more aggressive and distorted. Um, so yeah, uh, Proto Mater have been around for, uh, I'm not sure when they formed, but their first album came out in 2012 and they've released a string of albums since then, which have been basically like um, moving from strength to strength with each record, culminating in 2017's Relatives and Descent, which is, uh, despite stiff competition, maybe my favorite record of that year. Oh, I go farther in lightness came out in 2017. Maybe my second favorite record of that year. <laughs> um, but it's a, that's it's like a, that's just like the meme where it's like I love one, ma- I love two. Ma- no, it's like, <laughs> yes. So, so I think that uh, relatives and descent is probably like we've had like a, this kind of resurgence of bands in this vein in the past ten years, and I think there are like, occasionally you get staple records that kind of like do w- this style with more confidence and more definite definition and more um, uh, brilliant songwriting than the other records. And there are basically two records that come to mind when I think of this. Uh, the first is Public Strain by Women from 2010. And the second is Relatives in Descent by Proto Mater. Uh, it's a fantastic record. I would say a perfect album. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, impressive first listens I've had this year. And I was late to it, only getting to it this year. So, all eyes were on Proto Mater to see how they would follow this record up. It was their most immediate record. It was their most accessible record. It was their most hook driven uh, record with the cleanest production. So another thing to shout out about this band is that the production is just always on point in all of their records, even when they're kind of doing something lower fi in their early, in their early days, they always like the drumming, the drums, the guitars, everything always sounds immaculate in the mix. Um, so the, yeah, the eyes were on them to see how they would follow that up. And now, um, after delays and a long wait, we finally have um, their fifth record, our Ultimate Success Today. Uh, and I uh, will probably speak last about this, both because I think <laughs> I suspect I have the most to say and also because traditionally I come last in the acronym anyway. <laughs> um, so let's go to Jake then and see what he thinks of this album. Okay. Well, I was a really big fan of Relatives and Descent myself just because I think I got on, it was a combination of the fact that Fantano gave it a glowing review and that it was a popular album on Sputnik Music. So I listened to that and my appreciation for it has only grown. Uh, And with Ultimate Success today, I really just had no idea what I was in for because I've only heard the one record of theirs, which, you know, bad, bad Jake, don't do that. But um, going into this, I was just like, I'm going to try to wipe the slate clean of expectations. And that, I think, was a good uh, methodology to approach this with. Um, I think Ultimate Success Today is a a damn good record, honestly. I feel like I run the risk of not letting the album stand out on its own if I keep comparing it to Relatives and Descent. It's just that the comparison is so easy to make because I think they're very similar albums, but Ultimate Success Today, at least to me, rings as being a distinctly more modern album there's it, they didn't shy away from subjects of you know the toil of modernity on the last album but this is very distinctly like it's a post punkier joy is an act of resistance so to speak <laughs> except there is no joy because yeah. this album even for the standard set on relatives in descent this is a dark fucking album like mm-hmm. pitch black nothing but cynicism sharp as fuck and it can kind of get overwhelming at points but even though that's a bit of a weakness for me it's also a pretty big strength because they go totally for broke i think the one distinct comparison i will make with the album and uh, relatives and descent is that relatives and descent like the drums on that album are god tier like unbelievably good i i am astonished by the drum work on those here, the Sonic approach is very similar in places, but I feel like they go for a way more overwhelming sound, which kind of drives things like the drums and the background in some songs. And I kind of wanted that to be a bit more pronounced, but it's still in service of the vibe that they're going for. And if you pay attention to the lyrics, uh, they, they are as dark and dreary and mm-hmm. gloomy, but they also cover lots of topics about like, um, like I Am You Now, a great <sighs> song that I think perfectly illustrates how it is to feel very online. 
And that is a perfect microcosm of the rest of the album. It, it has its weaker points. Like I would say that, uh, I don't really know how to put this and I, I'm using Tyler's least favorite terminology here, but Relatives and Descent is not an album with any skips. <sighs> well, you're right, it's not. Like, which I wouldn't exactly say for this one. It's, but I will say it's a tight listen. It never overstays its welcome. Uh, it, it gets the job done. Um, and it definitely feels a little bit more political, but I don't know. There is something about Relatives and Descent that makes that album a bit more accessible and that I'm more likely to return to it. And I'm not sure totally why, but like, I really like this. It's just that it sort of amplifies some of the things in their music that I find mm -hmm. the least interesting, which is why I'm sort of caught in a nexus between the two albums. But I can't undersell. It is a very sharply written record, a very mm -hmm. careful album, and, and many times a boisterous and overwhelming one. I think that vocal performances mm -hmm. on this are just as good as, and the lyrical content is just as good before. The lead singer, who I don't know the name of, but... Joe Casey. Joe Casey. He has a very... He, the whole band, really. Very Nick Cave. He sounds yeah. exactly like Nick Cave's like five, first five albums, and the <laughs> vibe is very similar to that. So if you are a fan of that kind of shit... Can I caveat you, that, if that's all right? Yeah, go. Um, also, can I just go after you, because I feel like I can contrast your yeah. opinion well. Um, he sounds like Nick Cave, if Nick Cave was a drunk Englishman. Yes, I mean, honestly, it, that is very much... I mean, it, it also, I would say it's somewhat comparable to Tom Waits on certain songs where he just accentuates the, the slow, dull, monotone just drowl of his voice delivering this, but it's not above having its energetic moments. Um, and just because I think the record is a little uneven, I would not stop that from re me recommending it. I think it is a damn good album. It's just that I feel like they may have set the standard slightly too high, either that or I just like the parts of their sound in their previous record more but I can't poo-poo this one too bad. It's a good record. Mm. I mean, like, the thing is about Proto Master is, is I have discovered them very recently. Um, and, he, and here's the thing. When your here's latest- Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> here's the watch thing. previous. <laughs> if you smile enough, then everybody smiles. Watch your previous episode of this podcast to get this. Anyway, um, when you're just getting into a band and the latest album cover is sky blue with a purple horse on the front. Donkey. Uh, donkey. You might say. <coughs> this donkey. is not the vibe. Anyway, my point is, this is not the vibe one expects from that album cover. Like you look at that and you look at that and you're like, ah, oh, this is going to be like sort of out there, proggy, fun, kind of entertaining. It is, it's not that. It's not that. Um, from a donkey. It evokes the colorful surrealness yeah, of it not just, very not well, the, It's not honestly. from the donkey. It's from those big, bright, yeah. catchy colors with sure. the oddness of the donkey thrown in. Sure. Um, <laughs> But even then, uh, Relatives and Descent, I enjoyed, but I saw it in my Ultimate success today, the uh, music from the movie The Mule by Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone other than Armand White watch that movie? I, I saw that, that movie. I like that movie. You did? Yeah, it is. It's not I'm just great. shocked you've it's seen like, it. It's like <laughs> <laughs> It's just... It's just like, it's not top tier Eastwood or anything, but I had a good time watching it. No, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> anyway, God. The last Clint Eastwood film I saw was Invictus, which sucks. Anyway. Um, oh, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Anyway, um, so. Relatives and descent. descent. I said on my music board review for that that it was good, but I thought I'd like their next album more. Um, and I didn't at first, but I do now. Um, and it's like, I wasn't, me, for, honestly. I'll agree with that. Yeah, I, I wasn't forced to sit with relatives and descent in the way that I am for the albums we talk about for this podcast. Um, because like, you know, I have a rule and I think we all have this rule that there's a certain amount of times to listen to an album before we talk about it here. 
um, yeah. at least on our full review segments. Um, and the thing is, it's like Proto Martyr's music, it holds you at a distance, you know, um, in a way that I don't always vibe with. I talked in the Jesse Ware review about how my experience of music is largely textural. Um, mm -hmm. I like a good vibe. Um, and this album has a strong vibe, but it's a vibe that stops me really being able to pay attention to the rest of it, which is annoying when the rest of it is so good. Um, I really like this record quite a bit. Um, I don't think I'm going to like it as much as Tyler, but um, I still like it. Um, Day Without End is a stunning opener. Um, yes, great song. For those like really anxious snare guitars and, and the building gets uh, snare guitars. What are we talking about? Snare, uh, hi hat. Sorry. The building hi hats. Yeah. And, they're um, amazing. They're the, oh, they're fucking so good. Yeah. Um, and that building guitar riff, um, that just repeats and repeats. The lyrics are really dark and sort of, uh, ambivalent and ambiguous. And, um, it's just very like threatening and building. Um, but again, it's, it's, it might be the amount of reverb, I'm not sure, but it's mixed in a way that makes the actual barrier of entry for engaging this album at an experiential level higher than most. Um, I would agree with that, that completely. In a way that I don't feel with Nick Cave. Um, and I don't want to throw Nick Cave about as like the biggest post-punk name I know. Like it's like the meme where it's like, a uh, man watches a movie after only having seen Boss Baby. Hmm, this gives me big Boss Baby vibes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. Ultimate Success today is truly the Boss Baby of 2020 albums. Truly, is it? Is it? Process um, Boss Jake, Jake, uh, Jake, Baby. Jake, sometimes you need to know when to not talk. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, but no, like Nick Cave records, I can just get on board with like that. Um, even the densest ones. Um, but this took a lot of sitting with me. Um, but that being said, songs like I Am You Now, uh, I Am, and uh, June 21, just I vibe with immediately. Um, something that comes up a lot on this album is the interplay with a, a bass guitar and a woodwind section. Mm, like, yes. Not many albums have a woodwind section, yeah. Uh, but I, I just, I love the tone of of those instruments here. It's so, um, how do I put this? It's like sitting in syrup, you know, mm. um, and just staying there and sitting in the syrup and not moving. But you just what, have the syrup around you. What I think is so effective about their inclusion is that they create a really menacing dissonance in the music between mm -hmm. yeah, the guitars. Yeah, I agree. I agree, but it's not and... just that. Um, it's the fact that it's like, it is menacing and dark, but it's also kind of cuddly. Um, I don't know, it's like having a hug with a tiger, if that makes sense. Um, and coming out with some whack metaphors. No, I, 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 like not I like that. This like show it. is whack metaphors, I mean. <laughs> uh, talking, and everything, everything album is just whack metaphors. Um, anyway. Uh, I love I love the song Tranquilizer, especially for this interplay. Yes. Um, God, it's just a painful song as well. It is. Uh, I'm gonna the, I'm gonna have a hard time choosing a least favorite track because there are some songs in here I still still just kind of blend together for me. But when this album when the songs stand out, they really stand out. And even when the songs are blending together, they work as a vibe. You know, like. I can't really complain about all about some of the songs feeling the same when the vibe is so strong and I'm just vibing with it. Um, well, the thing is like, this is a tight 10 tracks. I don't think I, there is any redundancy here. Perhaps there are some songs that blend together in a, an instrumental sense, but if you, but mm -hmm. sitting down reading the lyrics while listening to this as well, it's very yeah. apparent that, that sure, Joe sure. is going is, is, is looking at specific ideas that are, like individually on different tracks so there's no re real repetition here um it's it's, sure. it's the decision to make this a tight 10 tracks like their shortest record in a while i think is really adds to the impact of it mm -hmm. no absolutely um but i do want to talk about the closer worm in heaven which um while i like but don't 
love this record. That song is maybe my favorite song of the year. Ooh. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to let it sit with me. We'll see. Um, but it's just so bleak and sad and aggressive and, and, and mournful. Um, so it just it, it just it feels like this is what it, it feels like to give up, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an amazing title for a song, Worm in Heaven. Um, but just I can't listen to it and just not feel haunted. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've heard talk this might be Proto Martis' last record. In a um, way, it is an amazing note to close on, but I I almost feel too sad for the real people behind it if this is the last song they write, because it's so sad. Yeah. But the lyrics are immaculate. Um, it's just a knockout of a song. Um, and you could feel, it's, it's like how I feel about Puzzle, but Biffy Clyro, it's like the whole album could be trash, but if it ends on the song Machines, it, it saves all of it. Um, yeah. And while neither album is trash, they end with 10 out of 10 songs, you know? Mm. Yeah, they definitely know how to close an album. Like my favorite Proto Matter song is Half Sister, which is the closer on Relatives and Descent which is just a fucking incredible song. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I agree. This is this a particularly potent closer here. And I want to just touch on that notion of the last album as well, because Joe Casey did an AMA on Reddit, I think just a couple days ago. Uh, And he addressed this this notion that it might be their last record. And he said that when he initially said those comments in the interview that he said them in, like he was in a particularly dark space and he's realistically, he's, he doesn't want this to be the last Brody Marta record. Yeah. He's hoping that uh, their band will be able to tour again at some point because that's literally the only way they can make money. Um, that was mm. the reason yeah, why. Yeah, no, that's um, true. So many yeah. smaller bands as well. Yeah, but they don't intend for this to be their last record. They want to keep making music. So I just wanted to put that out there. Good, good. Absolutely good because they're a really good band that I, I think uh, I am yet to hear a record from them that makes me think, um this is going to be my favorite record of theirs um i think so i think might, they have the potential to make that record so. you might enjoy their earlier record Sersha, particularly i'm thinking of the record under color of official right just because it's more mm-hmm. punky it's more on the aggressive side of the post-punk sound they've kind of gotten less aggressive with each record i think in a lot of ways um, okay in terms of like sonic qualities um, so you might like their earlier stuff more. That's a hell of an album cover for Under Color of uh, Official Right. Yeah. Like, Dog. whoa. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. They're like animals on their album covers, it seems. Yeah, and there is a significance uh, to the donkey as well that I'll touch on um, if no one Yeah, yeah, does. I can't wait to hear it. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, all right. I pretty, um, I pretty much talked out my opinion. Cool. August, how do you feel about it? All right, this moist towelette here. Uh, anyways... Uh, ultimate success today. Uh, Proto Martyrs, a band I feel I have an interesting relationship with in that theoretically I feel they're a band I should love a lot more than I do. But that's that's not to say this is a, a bad album because first off, as Sersha has mentioned, uh, Proto Martyrs, just the sheer aesthetic and vibe of Proto Martyrs music is just absolutely entrancing just this almost middle eastern aesthetic to how their sound feels reminds me kind a bit of like uh at least it feels like this could be paired with like uh uh, kind of something similar to bedlam and goliath in terms of just the intensity being brought here fused with their aesthetic on this record uh, and, but what I feel really drags me out of this aesthetic and what I feel can be the damning factor for a lot of people with Proto Martyr is like what Joe Casey does for you as a vocalist, as a singer, as a musician. Because myself personally, I'm not a huge fan of his like rambly dry deadpan style of 
delivery. It doesn't doesn't really capture me in the way I feel. I feel it's supposed to. I mean, yeah. Uh, I really do love a lot of the oppressive, powerful instrumentation across this record, particularly on songs like uh, Processed by the Boys, I Am You Now, among others. And really, the instrumental presence is just what I feel makes this album work. It's just that, in contrast with Joe Casey, I it kind of feels like I'm eating food that just doesn't go down right. It's very, very odd. Uh, the, I really enjoy, though, the a, the a Forest, which I thought was a song that where Joe Casey really balanced vocal delivery and deadpan. It felt like a very nice, healthy mix. Uh, and I find universally that I, I didn't enjoy the singles released for this album as much as I enjoyed just like the deeper cuts into this album, which I know is a weird thing to say because I think that's what would appeal to more people, but I just found the I found the mix and instrumental presence and the balance of things a bit more bit more to my liking on this album's deeper center. Uh, but yeah, I really love just the apocalyptic hellscape presented by this album. It is very dark, very depressing, and they are speaking to many socially relevant themes across this album that I, it's almost like the way Morgan described uh, RTJ4, where it's something that feels like it is an absolute perfect encapsulation of the moment we're, we're living right now. And I really appreciate what this album is going for. I just don't think it really, it just doesn't really click with me a whole lot. Uh, but Worm in Heaven, fantastic closer. Uh, and... That's about all I have to say, honestly. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing your, your feelings, August. Um, yeah, I'm surprised no one has mentioned uh, Processed by the Boys yet. That's, um, that's a really good song. killer song. That's an amazing song. Uh, that is one of my favorite songs of the year. That basically, yeah. Anyway, uh, I've got a lot to say about this album. Like, I, I feel like I'm settling into a pattern here where, like, there's a record where I'm super passionate about, but then most of you are like, I mean, there are elements of it that I enjoy, but it just doesn't come together as a whole. And then I kind of come in after you and I'm like, here's my <laughs> essay on why this is amazing. Uh, and I, I feel like, like that's the best <laughs> record, though. It's, it's like, you love it for it's your the best reasons, discussion, you know? Yeah, well, I don't want to be like... like um, I don't want to be saying like that. I want. I don't want to be in that mode for every every episode because it then no, like, but my I feel like that about endless, but um, no, but I feel that way about most of my favorite records is that yeah. almost everyone else I know is coming. Oh no, no, for sure, for sure, for sure. I'm just talking about in the context of new releases. Like it's been re things have been really good for music since we started this podcast. <laughs> like it's, it's not. True. I don't like gush over new albums every single week. Typically. Um, but like just lately there have been records that have been coming out that have just really <laughs> fucked my life up in a good way. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, so yeah. And like, I want to touch on a lot of things. Like I want to touch on a lot of things that you've already mentioned in terms of like, yes, the record is less immediate. Uh, that is very much a purposeful decision. Uh, to eschew a lot of the hooks and a lot of the grab, a lot of the attention grabbing nature of relatives and descent, uh, and for a good reason here, I'll get into that. But but basically, like uh, Ultimate Success Today is a record that is steeped in an oppressive, uh, unbearable darkness. Uh, it's the product of all of the rage, uh, both at the world and at oneself, that becomes boiled over and beyond control when you're in a depressive spiral. Uh, there's an air of death. Uh, in this album uh, of an overwhelming pain that seems to be pushing Joe Casey to the edge of existence. Uh, a lot of records uh, in this kind of style and vein get called sort of dystopian or are, uh, people will label them as like, uh, at like attacking or like, uh, not attacking, uh, 
examining dystopian themes or whatever. But I think few albums I've heard in recent memory truly embody the dread of total annihilation like this one does. Uh, I love how the opening line of the album, uh, I could not be reached as a conclusion slash answer to the closing line of relatives in descent. She's just trying to reach you. I could not be reached. It is the, uh, the heart wrenching, devastating, um, conclusion, uh, to that or answer to that records open ended question. It is like, uh, is there a way to dig ourselves out of this? Is basically one of the thesis statements of relatives in descent. And, and this th thesis statement of this record is, is basically not necessarily answering that question with either yes or no, but just saying that I'm too fucked up to be able to do anything. I, I literally can't move. <laughs> like it's that literal paralyzing depression is all over this record. And it's something relatable. that I, yeah, I feel in a relatable way. <laughs> like it's, it touches mm. on it. Like there's, emotion there's like a, a psychological energy to this album that i it feels like it has been siphoned directly out of like specific experiences i've had this year i uh, like and in like ways that i've been uh, and it's uh uncomfortable and it's affecting and it's um it's it's difficult you know um I mean, listen to the slow build in the opening track, Day Without End, a broiling intensity that rises and rises as Casey shouts this refrain, dull ache turned sharp, short breath never caught. This idea of being fixated on like, and this is another thing that Casey's come back to in interviews and kind of touches on throughout this record is kind of like the inherent weaknesses and limitations of the human body, like feeling like, uh, like you can't trust your body to like like that it might suddenly attack you and like with cancer or with a heart attack or because he touches on at one point in the record how his father died of a sudden heart attack after a hernia surgery um so there's this idea of like being constantly preoccupied with your own physical vulnerability and like this feeling that you're you could just collapse and die at any moment is is really really palpable here um and yeah so this song this opening song with that refrain and the way that that casey's basically shouting it at, by the end of the song uh really uh gets that feeling in a, in a really um potent way and then so this intensity builds and builds and builds and then it falls out and and we get uh processed by the boys picking it up as kind of like the the climax of that song a Day Without End, in a lot of ways, is basically like an intro to this lead single. Um, it picks up that energy and it rolls with it. It's a visceral, blaring excoriation of the police and more broadly of a government of unchecked power wreaking de devastation on its people. Um, and the songs... Out so there's, there's so much um, violent and hateful energy in this song, like directed squarely at the state and squarely at, at police. Um, and it's really kind of rich with this kind of dripping, sardonic, angry attitude. Uh, but then in the song's outro, Casey's vitriolic delivery gives way to a gentler, sadder lament. In their tattered Damalian uniforms, they look so nice. Tattoos of their children, so cool, so nice. This time we'll be gentle enough. Next time we'll be different. They'll be gentle enough. It's an uncompromisingly bleak vision of destruction and genocide, taking the police state to its logical, horrific conclusion and developing a real resonance in the context of this year um, and, and the way that things have been in the US um, where the band is based. Um, the absolute belter, uh, I Am You Now, is yet another track that's absolutely filled with bile and righteous fury. Uh, it's Casey's attempt to describe the landscape of social media for what it is, a headache-inducing cavalcade of performativity, where liberals profess their support for causes by hypocritically stealing their oxygen and diverting the attention to themselves. And you get this in lyrics like, you who suffer beyond margin of quadrant, join the conversation, shut mm. your mouth, you're starting to lose focus. New face, your woe, easy money in absentia, 
hogs feed on the ungathered dead. Off camera, we stand with you weeping. Keep your hands out of my pockets. I'm talking. I am you now. Um, and literally in that in that bridge, he's just screaming, face the brand and see. Yeah, like no, the, the sense of poetry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that like double just, meaning. Like you said about that verse. I just want to highlight the sense yeah, of poetry he brings, you know. Totally. Like he's incredibly... Um, no, I just want to say like, that verse is, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that line, that face the brand and see, because there's a double meaning there. Obviously, there's talking about... Um, uh, you know uh, how corporate social media is, and how everything, all the messages that we see are basically bought and paid for. But also, like this idea of being branded, of actually like being uh, the property of, of, um, of, of, or of like people in positions of power treating um, causes as their property to monetize and to utilize to brand. Um, it's a brilliant line, and it's and it's basically just. Um, like not even like focused on it's just an it's just a random line that is just so effective and i like how um by the end of the song these narcissistic figures have shed their masks entirely offering nothing but mocking boo-hoos in the outro uh it's a brilliant song uh and it's like the best songs in this record it's all the more effective for how wholly vitriolic and pissed off it is i've listened to the song a lot this week and it really goes um and then you go into the, the aphorist, uh, which is a softer but no less gut-wrenching portrayal of Casey's own depression. And there's like themes in here of a sense of disgust at the music industry and the mindlessness of corporate content masquerading as art, as well as his own feelings of uh, feeling as though his writing is inadequate and his music is a failure. Um, the poetic and upsetting June 21st captures feelings of disconnection and ennui as Joe and guest vocalist Half-Waif paint a picture of a world of constant nighttime. Uh, listen to some of the uh, imagistic writing here. Sirens doppel after semi-automatic report. Charges whine through the valley concrete. Reminds me of the squeal of stolen sprees across the fields of my memories. Instrumentally, the song has a paranoid strut that eventually kind of switches up near its conclusion as these really unsettling and dissonant strings provide a bed of chilling ambience, underneath which you can hear the sound of crickets and flies buzzing, the urban stink uh, realized in this very creative use of found sound. Comparatively, Michigan Hammers roars to life and both Casey's vocal delivery here and the central guitar riff demonstrate one of the recurring musical ideas of the record, monotony and repetition. Not monotony and repetition for lack of having interesting melody, but as a purposeful decision to underscore Casey's crushing, colorless depression. There's still an almost playful melody that squirms beneath the verses on this song, but it's buried in white noise as if suggesting the remnants of Casey's character and personality are pushing against some impenetrable screen that's keeping them in darkness. It's almost unbearably sad. Then you get the bridge of the song, uh, in which Casey recounts an almost spoken word, a true story from the Mexican-American War, in which American troops launched an assault from the sea on the city of Veracruz, and the horses and mules that carried the soldiers had to be thrown overboard into the ocean to fend for themselves, to either swim to shore and continue an existence in servitude or give up and drown. This is, I suspect, how Casey sees the world at the moment, and America specifically. And this is obviously the significance of the mule on the album cover, which I think Casey has also said is um, is. Also a, metaf is also a reference to uh, Brisson's film, O Hazard Balthazar. Um, Br Brisson being, the taste. Brisson the taste. being an incredibly uh, influential artist on, mm -hmm. on Casey. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Tranquilizer. Yeah. If you like the movies of Lynn Ramsey, you should check out Brisson. Yeah, totally, totally. And if you like the music of Pro de Marta, you will enjoy the films of Brisson as well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Tranquilizer utilizes that monotony I talked about in the last song some more in Casey's vocal delivery. He uses a single solitary note he uses to beat the words into our head like a drone. The riff itself is melodic but repetitive, borrowing its way into your brain like a virus. 
the vocal effects on Casey's voice in this song, as well as the mantra-like repetition, gives the impression of a numbed existence. We are tranquilizers in whatever form you want to take that metaphor, are necessary for survival so as to prevent us from being able to focus too intently on the horror around us. And another detail I want to shout out um, that's already been mentioned, but is the use of woodwind instrumentation on a lot of these tracks, including clarinet and saxophone, uh, which add a lot of character to the record, as well as enhancing the feeling of doom that the heavily affected post-punk guitars do well to induce. Uh, modern business hymns is another bemoaning of the ugly devastation that capitalist systems inherently construct and rely upon. But yet again, what makes Casey's take so incisive and biting is that he approaches these things from more abstract angles, balancing lines about how money is no matter to those who always have it, with more bizarre images of the rich supping on zebra mussels, boiled and pranked broiled in plankton, while the masses eat dirt and growth from built-up respirators. Ultimately, if this is a call to arms, it is a morbid and deeply sardonic one. As Casey finally intones, the past is full of dead men, the future is a cruelty, resign yourself. Bridge and Crown is even more despondent, almost to a fault, with Casey alluding to his father's tragic and terrifying death from a heart attack caused by internal bleeding following a hernia surgery, and the effect that this has had on Casey to render him both terrified of doctors and of his own ugly physical vulnerability, uh, and, and then as a result constantly being in this state of powerlessness. Uh, Closer Worm in Heaven reads almost like a suicide note. Both unsettlingly, unsettlingly pointed and specific, with lines like, keep a knife in your purse, be as needed as the nail, stick into things, stab into things. And almost blissful as well, as Casey reaches a state of acceptance following the record's arduous anxiety, encouraging and willing the listener to make better for themselves than he was able to do for himself. Uh, in a sense, the feeling of the whole record, but particularly here, is reminiscent for me of the vibe of Joy Division's Closer, uh, itself uh, developing the feeling of a dread-filled suicide note following Ian Curtis's death. This record has a similar emotional atmosphere, uh, if overall being more instrumentally an animated and less gnarly. Um, ultimately, Casey wraps up the album by saying, I exist. I did, I was here, I was, or never was, uh, descending into a repetition of the word never ad infinitum until the song suddenly dramatically stops and the album is over. Ultimately, I hope that Joe Casey's doing all right. Uh, I worry for him, but at the same time, I see that this record is likely um, an exorcism of these emotions as much as a communication of a constant emotional state like uh it's per, it, for all we know like these may be this may be casey embody embodying characters exclusively he may not really be speaking like about his own existence in a lot of these songs but you can feel the the that the emotions in these songs and the psychological turmoil in these songs are a result of of, of experiencing that uh and responding to the world um uh, it may be that this record is not as drastically dark for all of you as it as it is for me when I listen to it, but I do no, feel a, I do I do feel a frightening. It is yes, no, I, yeah. All right. Well, perhaps like I guess my point was that perhaps my I was concerned that I might have been um, uh, exaggerating it a bit, um, but I do feel a frightening recognition when I listen to it of the most dangerous and hopeless moments in my own life. Uh, when the grip I usually have on myself to take care of myself and, and get up and do things suddenly falls away and I'm left in the isolation. Um, for that, it's a work of art that has incredible personal significance to me and I think it's one of the band's most potent and affecting albums to date. Uh, I love it to bits. Wow, what a great... Fantastic. What a wonderful analysis of a record i enjoyed it a lot this this, this was your ultimate success tyler today mm -hmm. 
All right. So, does anyone else so, have anything else they want to say about this album before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, I, I have a brief uh, interjection, just kind of as a uh, response to what you've said, and mm -hmm. I feel that you've you've done a pretty excellent job at, at just capturing a lot of the things I, I see in this record, and I just I just kind of wish I didn't have the uh, barriers that exist for me to uh, enjoy it. Mm -hmm in the same way like this is the thing like it's an unfriendly right. record it's a record that makes a lot of decisions to distance itself from um from casual listening uh and like it's perfectly valid to be not a fan of that you know yeah yeah i, I did it it was at its best when i was like really single-minded into focusing on the album that's where it found itself for me yeah yeah all right. Um, ratings. Favorite Dave. tracks and okay. ratings. Jake, lead that'll, us off. That would be good. All right. Um, I'm going to say that I, my three favorite songs are probably Michigan Hammers, um, Processed by the Boys, and uh, let's go with like, what's the opening track called? Um, Days without end. end. Day without, Day without end. end. I, I I really like. I think the the album like starts and ends strongly. So I'll say Day Without End, and uh, I give it a, a a pretty pretty solid seven out of ten. Cool. Fair enough. All right, August. All right. Three favorite tracks are I did not mention it, but uh, Day Without End, I Am You Now, and probably The A Forest. A forest, whatever. When you first said and that, I thought I you said a forest, kind of... like the Cure song. I, I like, did too. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like I don't remember and that it. song. They covered that song. What? Okay, least what? Anyway, least favorite, I guess, would be like maybe Michigan Hammers, but uh, regardless, though, I uh, I appreciate a lot of what this record is going for, but but it ain't me. Uh, I'd, I'd give it a solid six. Fair out enough, of August. Fair enough. I want to just introduce Oh, also, my before... least favorite track is a, that June whatever that fuck that song was. That was my least favorite. Before you go, Sersha, I want to interject favorite. here to say that uh, despite not being here, Morgan has listened to these albums and he's passed on his ratings um, as well. Ah. And mm -hmm. Morgan gave this album a nine out of ten. Oh, wow. Yeah. I wish if, was if, I, if I can have my phone on out battery and still send in a review, then Morgan can do this. Yeah. Um, so Asha, your uh, your uh, favorites tracks. I'm gonna go with Day Without End, June 21, Tranquilizer and Worm in Heaven. My least favorite track was Michigan Hammers and it's getting a seven and a half. Fantastic. I thought you were like pausing, be like a seven and a half out of ten. <laughs> out of out of out of eight. Um all right. Oh shit. <laughs> so that's Tyler's rating is seven and a half out of eight. Uh <laughs> my three favorite tracks are really difficult to say. Uh, I do that a bit every week. Um uh, I'm gonna say I am you now, process by the boys, uh and the aphorist i'm going to shout that one out as well uh if i had to pick a least favorite track i would pick uh bridge and crown uh and i'm going to give this album nine out of ten Oof. all right all right that's exactly 7.7 .7 out of 10 oh. which is the upper echelon for us really fantastic uh, yeah yeah excellent Absolutely right. So, 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 so now it's time for our third segment. <laughs> well, yeah, second second album yeah. of the day. Uh, Why not? Yeah, yeah. Introduce it. Yeah, so yeah. you you can introduce this album, even though it's a Kiwi band, because <laughs> yeah, do uh, do you it. still know more so about sorry. these 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 people than I do. I people. So basically. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, say I these came... guys like I normally do because they're not all guys. No, it's just really fun. Just 
these people. <laughs> I am I'm detecting some hostility. <laughs> I love um I love that, you know, we're Kiwis are still getting out there making music. Giving it a go, picking up a guitar, you know. I love I, yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. I love like the Concords. Um, anyway, the Beths, New Zealand kind of alternative pop rock band. Um, I came across them just browsing YouTube. They were recommended to me. Um, I listened to some of the songs off their last record. Um, and I was like, I vibe with this. And I saw they had a new album coming out. So I was like, why not? Um, and in general, I do vibe with both of their records. I think that the lyrics on the first album are better but I think the music on this album is better. Um, the first one has a real kind of jaded, self-hating vibe. This one is much, I think, blander lyrically, but musically it's much more interesting. Um, you open with a song like I'm Not Getting Excited, which is like a very musically like energizing song, although I don't think it's doing anything new. I, I, I'm not theme. getting excited. Uh, that's basically going to be August's review, I think, in a nutshell. <laughs> I was waiting for that joke to be made. You might not uh, be the only one. Wow. But no, I think that's generally the theme of my review, is that I think that what they're doing isn't exactly innovative, um, but I think they do it exceptionally well. Not exceptionally well, but very well. I think they do, um, yeah. I, I think we talk about a lot of bands okay. on this show and acts on this show that are very like difficult and hard to, to really process. So I'm very happy to be recommending bands like sports team and the deaths that are just like a good time. Um, if you vibe with them, um, sure. and that's how we would describe the best is that I think this record is a good time. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's great, but it, um, again, um, songs like Dying to Believe, I remember almost nothing about. It's exited my head. Oh, I really like um, that song. <laughs> so, no, it's a really good song, but it, I remember zilch about it. It's a good song, though. Yeah. Um, but then I enjoy the run of Jumbo Gazers through Acre to Do You Want Me Now quite a lot. Jumbo Gazers being the title song, it's a very um, shimmery ballad almost like a pop song um yeah. the hook of uh, jump rope gazes it's just very sweet and melodic and stuck in my head and i think that is the band's real strength actually is crafting very strong vocal melodies that the instruments back up um they're always very melodic haha <laughs> um and just very strong and light and pretty and fun um and they craft a good hook and the song Acrid has a very vibey kick. Um, they, but um, the intro riff transitions into a very shimmery pop chorus, mm -hmm. um, which I think is probably one of the things that actually holds the band back. I think is um, they too often rely on very lightweight choruses with the verses being way more interesting musically. Yeah. Um, um, do you want me now? Um, I... I, I love this song quite a, quite a bit. Um, the backing vocals on the chorus uh, are very sweet and hooky and, and sugary, but it's just stuck in my head. In a way, when I listened to the song the first time, I was like, this is, this is lightweight shit, man. Like, this is, this is B tier, but it's just stuck in my head and it keeps sitting there. Just, do you want, do, 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 do you want? It's just sitting there. I can't get it out and I, I like it now. Quite yeah. a fair bit um the song out of sight is probably my least favorite song on the record then don't go away this sort of goes straight through me um miles of god of war is a high point on the record um it's got a very almost like a pop punk vibe um especially like late 2000s to early 2010s pop punk um i almost feel like largely based on the song but also the rest of the record that this band grew up um not grew up but uh sort of early on discovered the bands that i discovered in my youth um sort of that wave of pop punk that was around when i was really getting into music at that, that time mm. um that really influences i like feeling that vibe reciprocated back to me really um, um Eurobeam of light is a, a, a a lovely 
acoustic ballad and it's hooky as fuck. Um, I almost wish the record had ended there because I think the last song, Just Shy of Sure, is lightweight as fuck. Um, I think Your Beam of Light would have been a better place to end it. Um, again, overall, like I'm just really glad to highlight a band that I just think it's a really good time to listen mm-hmm. to and I enjoyed this album immensely. Um, I, I like it about the same as a Proto Martyr, but I'm going to return to this way more, I think, but just because it's easier. Um, and I think on a music podcast, it is important to highlight the bands like the Proto Martyrs who are important and, and difficult, but it's also valuable to highlight bands like this mm. that, are, that are fun, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to, I'm going to go, I want to go and eat if it's all right. Yeah, go on, I, go on. I, wanna, I, I basically have a fairly similar opinion to you, except I don't quite like the record as much, but I do like it uh, a fair bit. Uh, but what's interesting, I think, about our comparative opinions is that, like, the songs you like, uh, not all of them, but some, a lot of the songs you like are the ones I don't like, and the ones you don't like are the ones I like, so I think that's really interesting. Anyway, um, I think uh, the, these guys have a lot of potential. They're quite talented. Uh, for me, instrumentally and stylistically, it does kind of fall into very kind of standard uh, indie rock uh, tropes and, and sounds. Uh, like, this is the kind of band I would have been super into when I was, like, 15, 16, um, but like once you get to kind of when you're a little bit older you kind of heard a lot of bands who are basically the same as this band and it's like you don't have much of a need for a record like this but I don't think that is like uh, I don't think it's fair to kind of just say that and and then leave your opinion of that I think you should really like dig into what the record sounds like and, and whether from a more um, centered standpoint whether it's actually a good record or not and i think this is a good album uh it's a solid slice of indie rock and i like the way that the band flirt with grungier textures in their guitars as well like on the on the opening track in particular which i think is one of the stronger ones here it has a really strong melody and they also make a really creative use of backing vocals on a lot of the songs here as well that i think makes them stand out in in a certain way it doesn't make them stand out enough um to make them a great band but i think that it's a really good addition to these songs uh, Dying to Believe is a really good, uh, propulsive um, piece of indie rock that is reminiscent of Courtney Barnett and its self-aware musings and polished but ragged tones. Um, the band sound really good here. Uh, the, you know, like I said, the use of soaring backing vocals in this track in particular add a lot of char- character to the song. Uh, I think the title track, uh, Jump Rope Gazers, is the best song on the record. You probably agree on that. Um, maybe agree on that, Sersha. Um you probably you might have a different favorite, but that one, this one's easily my favorite. Uh, it's it's beautifully blissed out, uh, but yet melodically captivating. It's more of a ballad, but I think still uh, most of the band's strengths are on display here. There's some quite emotional writing in this song uh, from front woman Elizabeth Stokes. Um, it's quite tangibly emotional, actually. It's not amazing or, or game changing by any means, but I enjoy it for what it is quite a bit, actually. Uh, Acrid is a fairly strong and dreamy indie rock song as well, even if it doesn't like, not particularly memorable. Uh, Although I do think that from Do You Want Me Now onwards, the album runs out of steam quickly for me. Um, uh, And as the kind of, as some of the aspects I've kind of talked about that do set the band apart as particularly unique, kind of become a little bit more fleeting and less present uh, with some of many of the tracks kind of running together into this big soupy puddle of indie signifiers and bland toothless filler, um, there are occasional standout moments. I really like the guitar breakdown slash solo and out of sight. It has a real grip to it, um, even if it's mixed muddily. It's the only element of that song I really enjoy, but it is quite good. Uh, album low light don't go away is really cloying and dull. Um, Mars, the god of war, has more energy but lacks the comp- compelling songwriting to back that energy up. Uh, and folk ballad, You Are a Beam of Light, benefits, I think, from crisper, um, better production. The acoustic guitar on this song sounds really good, uh, even if lyrically it's kind of a bit, you know, meaningless. Um, I do enjoy the closer, um, Just Shy of Sure, though. I-, I think it's not as good as the first three tracks on the album, but it wraps up the album solidly enough. It has more of that blissed out guitar work. And it sounds genuinely blaring and thrilling here in parts, with those great soaring backing vocals adding beautifully to the song. At times, it reminds me actually of early real estate, 
um, I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with the band Real Estate, but, but they have a kind of similar use of these pretty guitar tones and, and, and vocal, incredibly beautiful, um, soaring, breathy vocals. Um, and yeah, they're a band who whose mileage, your mileage will vary because they're a very kind of like um, low key band that don't do a lot of uh, instrumentally ambitious stuff, but um, they work in the similar vein to, to this album for me, even if I don't like this album as much as I like most of their albums. Um, but overall, it's fine. Um, it's very much emblematic, I think, of the kind of just totally standard uh, indie rock that we New Zealand bands kind of have been churning out um, the past 10 years. Basically, go to any bar in my city. Uh, and you'll see on any given night a band that are just like the best doing very similar things. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's good that, that um, we have artists like that who are getting out there, who are, um, you know, doing, putting their music out there and getting recognition. Obviously, this is a band that has enough uh, recognition and indie cred for us to have heard of them and to be covering them. Um, yeah, so I, I, I appreciate what they're doing. I would love to see them try to kind of craft some more ambitious arrangements, push their um, songwriting a little bit, because there's clearly uh, talent here. Uh, it would just be great to see that talent being utilized in a way that really, um, you know, makes the talent more apparent and makes the talent more um, uh, showcased than this record does. But I mean, for what it is, it's it's solid. And I, um, I respect the band for, um, for what they do. And I hope to hear more from them. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it um, it is quite a genre generic thing, uh, but I really like the singing style of the lead singer as well. Um, just like it's it's quite, it's almost like the singing style. It sounds like she doesn't want to be there almost, but um, I kind of like that. It's, it fits the uh, almost like detached ironic feel that this era has in a way i like yeah and it actually another artist that reminded me of is um snail mail as well who, who yeah absolutely absolutely who, uh, i have mail. similarly mixed feelings on but when her music <laughs> hits it hits um yeah so yeah i would like to see her as well Lindsay jordan of snail mail i would like i'm very curious to see how her sophomore record turns out when it comes out because mm -hmm. again yeah. there's a lot of potential there it just depends on whether it's really pursued yeah, I feel that way about the debut snail mail record as well. Uh, okay, right, someone right. else. Anyone else? August. Uh, Time for a fall. Uh, uh, it's, it's just uh, not very uh, good, is it? Uh, <laughs> but I want to quote Jake because I think it perfectly encapsulates how I feel about this for something he said earlier on in the week in our uh, group chat. August, if you give this album higher than a seven, I will eat my shoe. He said six <laughs> in that message. I can swear it was seven. If it was six, I mean, it's I not think, wrong either way. I think in either case, Jake was making a pretty safe bit, to be honest. Uh, seriously, no. like, I was just like, okay, look, I don't want to pony up and eat a fucking chew, so I need to go a little <laughs> north of the equator here if you catch my trip. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go for it. I'm going to start off with similar feelings to uh, Sersha and Tyler in that I think the opening track, I'm Not Getting in Excited, is a super heavy earworm of a song. I really love, yeah, the, as Tyler, or Saoirse, I don't remember which one, described the more uh, grungy guitar lines, that more grungy guitar tone. I really love the contrast and sound between uh, Elizabeth Stokes's voice and that kind of, and that kind of riffing style. It just, it's some, it was like a song that immediately captivated me and I was like, you know, maybe I can sit down and listen to a whole album of something like this. Then the second song, uh, Dying to Believe, hits, and it captures a very similar tone. And I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe I'm actually vibing with this. And then the title track hits, and I'm like, 
you know, this is this is a ridiculously strong start for a for an album like this, and it's very clear that there's uh there's something going on here. I mean, uh, but then and the title track, of course, being a bit a bit more mellower, not as heavy as as what's come before, but it it provides a nice contrast. But that contrast is going to be the album's downfall because from here on out, it's like I'm listening to television static. It's just, <laughs> it is just like really generic indie. Like just the personality of the first three songs feels like it's been surgically removed from everything else on this album and it just eh, I can I can live without it in every sense of the word and I mean while there are some songs that are kind of catchy in the moment I mean you've got like uh, a lot of them are just cloying to an absolutely obnoxious degree. Tyler stole my line about don't go away being like just the worst mm. thing of all time to listen to. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it, this, this whole record, it, it feels like this band's in a developmental stage of their sound. And I want to see where they go from here. I want to see them gain more personality but as it stands i'm i'm not really vibing with this for sure um and i think what you're speaking to is something about why i i want i do like to recommend talking about bands like uh sports team and the Beths, where it's like even though they're they're just starting out and you know they have a fan base that's strong but small yeah um it's like I feel like if we get on the train with these bands now, it will pay dividends later. You know? No, yeah. I mean, I would love to see where uh, where they go. As I, as I mentioned, I just uh, I, I just want something with a bit more character and personality that doesn't sound like sixteen other albums I've listened to this year. But I, I think you make a good point for sure. Mm. Thank you. All right. That's so that no, no very good thoughts. Um, that just leaves Jack Thinney, Fantano. In a jams and tea first, I believe it's a first. <laughs> I'm gonna have to rep Team August yeah. <laughs> against and say, I just. The word of the day, well, two words, primary being obnoxious, the second being bland. Mm -hmm. And I mean, elaborating on that is redundant. I will do my best to do so without sounding that basic. That, like, I appreciate the, like, I agree with Sersha and Tyler fully and the whole, like, we need to cover bands like this because yeah, no. we, you know, giving them exposure and focusing on bands that are still like more forming their sound is incredibly important. And I hate that I'm not going to be somebody who at least is just like, oh yeah, I, I like this and I want to see where they go. And I guess I do want to see where they go because they could improve from this. But like, there's so much about the core of their sound that just does not fucking do it for me. <laughs> and primarily... It's the vocals, which in isolation are fine. But for an entire album's worth, when you don't change your vocal delivery and all of your songs are already kind of samey, August's television static argument really <laughs> rings true for me. It's very good. They're just good. like, yeah, like, again, they're good for a song. They're not good for a full 40 minute listen when the intonation or delivery doesn't change at all. And I am saying that as someone who enjoyed the Proto Martyr album, which consistently agree, like it's just Joe Casey being like, oh, duh, 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 like the whole time. I am you now. And I am you now. 
down. Process <laughs> by the <laughs> boys. Like, <laughs> but this, th- I feel like it, it hits a certain nerve in my brain where I'm just like, it, <laughs> and it, it's very unpleasant. I, I also find the production to be slightly misguided and unkempt. I think the guitars are mixed very, very thinly on the first, like, couple songs. Like, it gets better at some songs, like, especially some of the later tracks, like Mars the God of War, I think, has a, a better job at that. But other times, they're just mixed so thinly, I feel like I can barely fucking hear them over everything else. Like, it's, it's a summary album, and it's bright and it's occasionally pleasant. That's pretty much the only compliment I'll give it. Like the lyrics, I'll also agree with Sergio. I don't know their last album for reference, but they're quite bland here, so they didn't grab me. Uh, The repeated refrain of I wanna run into you on Acrid sounds lazy as fuck. And it's a microcosm of why I don't like the performances on the album all uh, that much. I also think, in general, especially their last album, this just really makes me think, like, wow, I'd rather be listening to After Laughter by Paramore right now, just because it's like, this is Diet Paramore. And, like, and there are also moments where, like, they have a stiff electronic drumbeat at the start of Do You Want Me Now? And I'm like, okay, but you have drums, and they have been good on other songs and here you just didn't do that and it sounds worse and I don't get it. And again, like most albums that I don't end up liking on here, all of these problems are amplified tenfold when I have to listen to this album more than once. Mm -hmm. Makes a 40 minute album feel like an 80 minute one. And I like to think I have a good sense of patience because I listen to a lot of long shit like, I, I want them to find their voice. I really do. I want them to be a bit more dynamic. I want them to explore different avenues. And I hope to God they can, because if they pigeonhole themselves this early on, I feel very, very bad for them, because they clearly have talent. They clearly have a knack for occasionally mm-hmm. hooky songwriting. Like, there is a solid core here that needs to be expanded upon. It's mm-hmm. just that in this record, I feel like it's not at all. Mm-hmm. And don't go away. Um, my only note is, please go away. Wow. It's so, <laughs> so repetitive. And I just never, I'm for, not for a single moment am I enjoying myself. And like the second half actually reminded me a lot of um, Great Grandpa, uh, specifically their first album, less so um, Four of Arrows, but they have that sort of like layered, luscious indie rock vibe except the layered instrumentation on here, I just don't really find to be all that compelling. And and overall, it just, this is like, I would compare this album most, like, if I had to make a weird Jake analogy, it's like that cheap bubble gum that you get when you're a kid in Halloween. It's like got a yellow and blue wrapper and you chew it for 10 seconds. And then the second the flavor is gone, it's just like, this is just in my mouth now. Ew. And then you spit it out. And that's pretty much this album. Uh, no, I can understand your feelings about them. I mean, look. When the first Imagine Dragons album dropped, that was um, a record that at the time I got stuff out of. But I looked at it and I was like, there's good stuff here. There was bad stuff here. And they, they could go either way in the rest of their career. And they went, the, the, they went to the bad place. They, went, um, they they did indeed go oh, to yes. the, maybe debatably the worst place. Yeah, and I feel like the best are in a similar position where they have good tendencies and less good tendencies. Very true. Um, and they could go either way. Very true. But uh, mm. uh, yeah, that's right. I, that is the extent of my thoughts. Can I just say something real quick? And this of is course. just a funny note. Throughout this discussion, I swear I forgot like half of the songs you guys mentioned existed. <laughs> and it took I had to keep it up in the look. It, it took um, people saying them for me to be like, oh yeah, I was on that this one. album. Mm-hmm. What it, I don't know what it sounded like, but it probably yeah. sounded like the rest that, of them. That's why I always take like notes on each song, but it's, mm-hmm. yeah, to each their own. 
No, I, I try to take notes on each song, but if it gives me nothing, I, I can't write That's nothing. Fair. I, That's fair. I, I did the same thing, and I was just like, I am writing the exact same notes for every single song at this point. I'm not gonna. That's fair. All right, shall we go into our um, favorite tracks and ratings then? I would, I would uh, love yeah. to. Sure. Let's do the so same. You sound near way. death. I'm not. I'm just a vibing man. It's all good. Let's mm. do the same order that we reviewed in. So, Sersha, you go first. I so my favorite tracks are I'm not getting excited, jump rope gazers. Um, uh, yeah, probably do you want me now? Um, and my least favorite <laughs> track is Don't Go Away. And it's getting a seven. Okay, fair enough. Uh, my three favorite tracks were jump rope gazers, dying to believe, and I'm not getting excited. First three tracks. Uh, and my least favorite track is Don't Go Away, and I'm giving this a 6 out of 10. Chill. Oh, and um, Morgan is also I mean, giving this a 6 out of 10. Yeah. He is. I mean, I'm going to mirror exactly Tyler's favorite and least favorites. I'm just going to come to the conclusion that this album is a solid, like, 5. Chill. Interesting, interesting. Hmm. I feel, and I'm going to justify that rating by saying, I feel with albums like Deep Down Happy, I maybe went a little too hard rating wise. Right. So I, I feel this is a I fair comp. Yeah. And I, I just want to say as well, uh, as an aside, I think uh, Jake, you said like, I'm, I'm gonna, it's going to be a rare case where I'm on Team August today, and it's really funny mm-hmm. you said that because you two have agreed a lot on this podcast. really yeah like you have, you have the same rating for 100 gigs the same rating for uh heim same rating for black dresses uh the same rating almost the same rating for boris proto martyr um I feel like the podcast has grown to the point where it's started like you and i were really similar and yeah. like morgan and sarah show were really similar and then now i've grown to team august and morgan has grown to team tyler and sarah just sort of in the middle just hanging out it's basically flip a coin and i'll be on either team yeah well sarah you're the centrist of the podcast don't say yeah. that i was gonna say, say i was that. like this is i was gonna say like sarah is not gonna fuck with being called a centrist in any context <laughs> it's true oh no <laughs> Yeah. Oh, comrades, comrades. Come the, the, next week, it'll be, the, the reviews will be really reactionary. From so, so, lads, my next recommended God. album is um, the Internationale by the Communist Choir. Love it. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, is that everyone's ratings? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, Jake's, I think. Oh, Jake's. Jake. Jake. Um, my three favorite songs are, honestly, it's, I'm not getting excited, Dying to Believe in Jump Rope Gazers, because those songs were, I, I do think they are the strongest, but they are also the songs I, since they're at the beginning, I was the least tired listening to them, and I'm going to give the album a, a, a four. Yeah, I still Do you have a least favorite song, though? Oh, God, yes, it's, um, Don't Go Away. <laughs> good choice, okay. good choice. Yikes. All right. I so think everyone said don't go away. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's terrible. It's a bad uh, song. Okay. No, it's, it's objectively the worst <laughs> song. I just want to say, I think in case really... the bits are listening, please don't go away because we're about to no, review absolutely. another no. album. <laughs> I just want to say, um, the thing yeah. that got me about don't go away is um, it's the fact that it did the da da at the end of every bar, um, which went out of fashion 10 years ago. Mm. Mm. But now you've got another album to talk about. My and it's your choice. My recommended album. So this week, I recommended we discuss uh, acclaimed artist Bruce Springsteen's kind of swan song to his golden era, "Tunnel of Love," his eighth studio album, and I think. This is going to make for a very fascinating discussion because I think of Tunnel of Love as almost being a counterpoint to Springsteen's previous material on a thematic level because a lot of what he's written before has been songs about 
being free, being an individual, and just falling in love. But here he's writing to uh, the ideas of being trapped and falling out of love. And I, I mean, I won't say being trapped is like exclusive to this album, but that is my more general point. But I think, uh, I think that's a fair introduction to this album. And uh, does anyone want to jump on this? Um, I was just going to say, we are all, save for one of us, pretty big Springsteen disciples. And I have a connection to this song because of, of my, uh, one song on this record because of my youth. And I think generally it's accepted that Tunnel of Love is sort of a transition point between his his best run of albums and his like least to like popular and acclaimed ones followed this. So I feel yeah. that August pointed out that not only is this a like thematic departure, but it's also kind of a quality departure in that I like, this isn't the first time I've heard this album because I listened to them back when I had like gone over Springsteen again, just in my like awakening of him. And this album did not hold up as well as it did in my memory. Like not even kind of. And like, I didn't even consider it like remotely on par with something like Darkness on the Edge of Town or The River or even Born in the USA. Uh, and I, so I was expecting at least to just be like, this will probably be a considerable step below. And, and it is, um, but I actually have found myself, I prefer a lot of his later records to this. And I think a lot of it stems from the fact that the first half of this album is a rocky start. It is weird and kind of wonky. And I think like the first song generally is sort of a, a vibe for the whole thing. And I, it, I, I'll just go out and say, it. I think it's kind of a bad song. No. I think it's, it's minimalism does not work. It's lyricism is bland and, and like just trite. And that is sort of the case for a lot of songs here i think ain't got you and tougher than the rest are like like this is what people who don't like his music think his music is and like i just listened to it and was like bruce man come on i feel like you've written better versions of these exact songs on the river what what are you doing Oh, yeah. if i may jump bit. in here yeah go there ahead. is like one that's like so direct it's astonishing like the song cautious man is like literally uh, down bound train like it's yep. literally that song just it like worse fuck. this this feels like he had it, right it feels like this album is a bunch of b-sides from his other records and he just kind of mastered them and tossed them into this, which is funny considering Nebraska is literally a demo tape, which, you know, so if, you know, if anybody could make this work, you'd think it would be him. It gets better midway through, like weirdly, like right at the title track, we get something a little better. I don't think Tunnel of Love is a great song, but I think it's a good enough one. But then the run we have from Two Faces to um, Valentine's Day, I think is really good. I think um, Brilliant Disguise is, I, I like that song as much as I used to. Um, I think it's a great song. I think it's a catchy song too. It's something that would fit right in on Born. And it's, it, it, it gets to the heart of a lot of the thematic content on this album that I feel that the first half is just totally devoid of. Like, I feel like everything thematically too is just totally truncated into the back half. And Brilliant Disguise is this great proclamation of, of, sell, of doubt in the other person that you're like, you want to become involved with that you don't know if they're putting up a front just because of the nature of relationships and how like maybe the version of yourself or the themselves that they're presenting is uh, dissonant from who you actually are. And that's a source of anxiety for like me all the fucking time. So I'm like, I relate to this heavily and then you go to one step up which for my money is the best song on the album which i think is genuinely terrific like a top tier springsteen song a this is the kind of song you want to hear on a record like this going into it and i think it is a a 
really big ironic step up lyrically speaking and when you're alone is pretty much the same vibe and i think valentine's day is also one of the better songs he's maybe written in the sense that it just it, it really gets to the the heart of this facet of springsteen's like persona this more vulnerable direction he's trying to take in the more like trying to veer away from the whole independence thing and focusing on his connection with people. And it's just that he does that really well, but he's only doing it on half the album. And that just means for me, this is a super, super uneven listen that is just very strange to listen to as a Springsteen fan. I, uh, I guess I can kind of jump on that because I, I do have a lot of very similar thoughts to you in that this album, like first off, as you've mentioned, the opener to this album is really just kind of bad. Yeah, it's not oh. good. <laughs> and I, I feel that's almost by virtue of Springsteen on this album is trying to merge like the acoustic sensibilities of Nebraska yep. with some of the more synth pop sensibilities of Born in the USA. Mm -hmm. And it it has very mixed results. And it kind of makes me so happy that those were the two Sertial listened to before this album. Because yeah. it's, it's such a great point of contextualization for what this album is mm -hmm. because I mean, I think the song, like, Tougher Than The Rest is, it, no. it's okay, but it, it kind of feels like a parody of Bruce yes! Springsteen. Yes! Exactly! And yeah, he, he's making it. And, uh, yeah, I find, on this album, which, this is almost a problem that's exclusive to this album, where I find a lot of the stuff he's doing in third person on this album to just be really off-putting and distant feeling yep. Yep. where normally he can pull off that kind of storyteller like on Nebraska very mm -hmm. well but here yeah it just feels really weird I've mentioned cautious man yeah. and like spare parts also yeah. like, it just oh, yeah. feels like this album is absolutely just treading water like, I thought this and, album was going to be straight bad, bad for the first half of it. No, it, it very, <laughs> it is, it walks the line very delicately. And I mean, yeah, Walk Like a Man is, it's an okay song. It's like, yeah, it's just <laughs> kind of, it's, it's awkward. It feels awkward because he's yeah. like Damn, taking nice. guitars and synths. And just meshing it into a weird song that I didn't quite, that I did, it's meshing it into a weird song that I didn't quite vibe with. But that being said, yeah, the second half of this album is genuinely pretty great. I mean, Tunnel of Love is pretty good. Uh, Two Faces, a little basic, but I still got some enjoyment out of it. Mm. But then you've got Brilliant Disguise and One Step Up, which are just, for my money, two songs that are at least in the top 20, if not top 10, of Springsteen's entire career because Agreed. they're just, they're what you want and you just kind of get cucked by this album for so <laughs> long. <laughs> I hate it when I get cucked by the boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah, you guys are being a little bit more negative than I was expecting. Holy shit. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, you make good points. I don't love this album, um, but, but yeah. <laughs> okay. But, no, I think all that being said, I do think this is a good album, if only for that second half but it, it really does seem indicative of the direction he in his career he was closing off and the direction yeah. of his career he was going in yeah like the aging but the aging bruce the yeah the yeah the aging for sure. older maybe a bit 
maybe a bit more cynical Bruce. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just a weird album of him kind of not writing to his strengths. And sometimes it, it and sometimes it goes okay, but think, sometimes it the thing is it's just really spotty. Like it's just inconsistent. What it is is it just hasn't had enough time to- hadn't had it hasn't had enough work put into it. It feels rushed. This yeah. issue with this album, I think. Um because there are some of there are some great songs here. There's some of uh, Bruce, Bruce's best songs. Not a lot of them. Um, there are some of them. Um, yeah, I mean, August. I'm sorry. I don't want to go into my review if you're still if you're still going. Oh no, I I think you're uh, you're you're good to go on this one. Okay. So, um, Tunnel of Love. Yeah, it does come at an interesting point for Bruce, especially as the follow up to his most, I believe, his most commercially successful record. Um, yeah. And during the middle of, I believe, an acrimonious, I don't actually don't have really looked into the backstory. I don't know whether this is in the midst of a divorce or in the waning days of a marriage or post divorce. Uh, it was in like, uh, from as someone who kind of knows the story, it was like in the decline. It was an album that kind of exists in the declining half of his in like the declining midpoint of his marriage yeah right so in a lot of senses um this album comes is like even though this record i'm about to compare it to came later but this album is basically to make a very august core comparison this is basically uh bruce springsteen's paula by robin thick it's a much better record than Paul is. It just no, that it comparison is. occurred to me while I was listening to it. I mean, I it has to, a good song on it. Of course, it's <laughs> I had to bring it up. I've got to get it back, get it back. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so Tunnel of Love opens with the lonesome acapella of "Ain't Got You," with its shaky sounding acoustic strums and hesitant harmonica. Uh, underlining this feeling of anxiety and emptiness uh, as Springsteen's gently reverbed voice rings hollow in the mix. It is a unguarded Springsteen that we've never quite heard in this way before, even on the strip back Nebraska. Um, The warmer sense of Born in the USA return on Tougher Than the Rest, which is a love song tinged with melancholy, uh, Bruce pleading his case to be a better lover and a better partner than his wife's previous boyfriends it's kind of funny actually um in a way that i don't think he intended uh, it sounds pretty good uh but bruce's shtick in this mode begins to fall flat or at least lose what little, little energy and passion it has fairly quickly on the record and like again i think it is a product of of what really feels like a lack of effort on bruce's part in comparison and compared to the records that precede it and this is the thing, like this kind of album, the breakup album or the um, forlorn broken marriage record, if you want to be more accurate, is not something I generally like take issue with. Uh, but Bruce sounds weirdly non-committal here to that concept. Like the, most of the songs are about that to some extent, but he doesn't sound particularly invested on a lot of the songs. Um, he's almost sleepy. Uh, on a number of these tracks the first time in his career where it feels like he's really just going through the motions musically uh, and certainly the emotional through line that he attempts to channel into these songs uh, and it, that helps the record holistically but it doesn't rescue songs like All That Heaven Will Allow and Walk Like a Man from being ultimately a bit of a lifeless bore. Um, the songs where Bruce is more animated, like Spear Parts, feel as though his animated performance is trying to make up for lacking songwriting, which renders a song like that even more disappointing, uh, with his fantastic voice being there in service of empty platitudes, like Spear Parts and Broken Hearts. Keep the world turning round. Okay, Bruce. What do, what whatever the you say. fuck are you talking about, whatever man? Whatever you say, dude. Whatever you say. Cautious man feels like uh, Bruce trying to channel the Nebraska energy um, with kind of its storytelling mode. Um, But ultimately it feels more like a cheap retreat of that record than an extension of it. Um, The title track uh, sees Bruce going full synth pop and it results in one of the better tracks here, I think, uh, even if I wouldn't say it's as good as the pure pop perfection uh, on the previous album. Uh, The record though does get a much needed injection of life with brilliant single, brilliant disguise. Uh, it's an mm. earnest and beautiful pop ballad, 
And then, and I want to spend a bit of time on the song One Step Up, um, which is, uh, for my money, easily the best song on the album and one of the best songs that Springsteen's ever recorded, like top five material for me. Mm. Um, uh, Immediately, the forlorn mood of the track is established by a sorrowful melody and low, howling, distorted guitars that kind of plug in between the verses. There's a truly palpable sense of self-loathing and failure here uh, that immediately renders the song as one of the album's more earnest and affecting. Uh, The writing here is devastating, particularly in the final verse, where the true connection Bruce seeks with his wife is something he can only ever find in his dreams. And then in a master stroke, we get over a minute of wordless humming and cooing from Bruce in the song's outro. And somehow that shouldn't work, but it's somehow even more emotional than anything else in the fucking song. And I just cry. I just cry like a bitch and like a baby. It's so lonely and so lonely. It's really sad. Like it just makes me bawl. I love the song to bits and I, I can't believe that like there aren't more songs that are this emotionally palpable and tangible on this record for a record that you know claims to be about basically everything that is encompassed in this song it's like a real Mm. shame that that is so few and far between uh we then get the dull when you're alone with its endlessly repeated and utterly meaningless hook when you're alone you're alone when you're alone you're alone when you're alone you're really alone what a what is this man doing what is this man doing he drags he drags an otherwise adequate but uninteresting song into downright terrible territory i'm going to say i I feel like i think we can't pass over that so quickly after we dunked on new wave the way we did yeah i can't can't cut bruce some slack for this like when jake when you see like the second half of the record like this final stretch is much better i'm like to an extent, yes, the best songs are all there, but there's still shit like this on the yeah. second half of the record. And that other song, what is it, Two Hands or Two Faces? Two Faces. Two faces. I didn't even write Two anything. Hands. <laughs> I didn't write anything about that song because it's so fucking boring. Um, <laughs> although that song and um, uh, which other one? There are two songs um, that have this. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry, yeah, One Step Up is the other one, but I think it's more so in, in Two Hands, where... Um, Just call it that again. <laughs> there's, there's these, like, distorted guitar solo in the back that sounds re- weirdly reminiscent of uh, Robert Fripp's guitar solos and Brian Eno's early records. I just wanted to shout that out. Wow. Um, I think it's only I, I really... I see it. It's only, I, it's, I, I totally think, see it's it. It's only really on Two Hands where I think it really sounds that way, but... Um, Damn it. But uh, yeah, just really, it's the only interesting thing about that song. Anyway, so yeah, When You're Alone, I think is one of Bruce's worst songs that I've heard. It's really shitty and I hate it and it sucks. Um, but then you get a great closing track, uh, Valentine's Day, uh, which is a really melancholic ban- ballad that I think benefits from some straightforward writing from Bruce, really affecting, really upfront um, and about his feelings and about the situation that he is in and his responsibility for that. Um, it's not, an, not a perfect song or an amazing song, but it's a really good one. It ends the record nicely, I think. And yeah, it's really just a, this is record's really just an example of like where when a great song comes along, you're just like, this is amazing. This is what I want from Bruce. Why isn't the whole record like this? Like, why wasn't more effort and time put into crafting this to be the the pristine and affecting concept album it so desperately wants to be because every single song is kind of a variation on that theme it's just that so many of them are are quite bland again the only one i'd say is downright bad is when you're alone but but still there's there's too much blandness here um for me oh spear parts sucks as well actually i don't really like that song at all but yeah uh, overall um a real missed opportunity for bruce i think and it's a real shame That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Honestly, I think I can have... There, there's two points of comparison for this album. One of them is when we've ri- a couple of us have listened to and that I think that this album is quite comparable to Blue Valentine by Tom Waits. In many ways, I think that that is the album that this is trying to be. And 
Blue Valentine is is probably my least favorite Waits record I've listened to thus far. I do think it's a little bit uneven. That said, the thing is about that album is that what carries it is that Waits, despite being a, like, Waits is an actor masquerading as a musician. His entire career is him writing and acting out his characters. Like, if he's got a song that is about something from his real life, I couldn't tell you which one it was because he wholly inhabits these people. And yet he sounds so much more invested and sounds like he cares about these songs and gives these mournful Kentucky Avenue where you feel like the characters singing this song, like there is nothing more important to them than this. And it is the polar opposite here. And I think this record fully realized is Rustin Kelly's Dying Star. Every single song on that album is about his many struggles, but mainly his inability con to connect with people and especially specifically love and romantic, just sort of being the, like accepting being the incredibly toxic person that he was but also distancing himself from love in that way and that like that the back half of this album gave me huge dying star vibes and I was angry at this album for a little bit too because I was just like a Springsteen breakup album should be the best fucking thing I've ever heard like there is no excuse for this shit to not be like a masterpiece and then I'm like oh yeah dying star exists which is basically just this but perfect so like I can't even be that mad Beautiful um, Jake or comparison there. Mm. Sersha, do you want to share no. your thoughts on the album? Hello. So um, I have known and known the music of Pre Springsteen for a very long time, even if I'm not a massive fan of his music. As I said in my review of Nebraska, but, uh, the issue I have with his music is quite hard to put into words, but it is epitomized by the fact that he is a rock star who calls himself the king. Um, and that comes through in his music, I, in a way I have in the past found kind of obnoxious. Um, with Nebraska, um, which was the first full length album I listened to from him, um, I felt like that, was a record that was kind of half of it was just Bruce Springsteen songs with less um, thorough orchestration, and half of it was sort of genuine attempts at the at the sound that that record gets compared to um, the ones that were just Bruce Springsteen songs with less great orchestrate, well, with less um, big instruments. I, I had less time for because it just had the vibe of spring scene songs that just turns me off anyway. Um, and the other half of it, I liked more, but still felt like I'd rather be listening to the albums that was aping. Um, but there are some songs on that that I genuinely love. Um, and there are some songs on Born in the USA I genuinely love, like uh, Dancing in the Dark. But in the end, listening to Born in the USA kind of kind of convinced me that I don't get why Bruce Springsteen is looked at as like this rock hero, because that is a pop album that fits really well into the rubric of 80s like synth pop. Um, and Dancing in the Dark, Dancing in the Dark, which is my favorite song of that record, fits the best into that rubric and it works the best as that kind of song. Um, and it still just had so many of the vibes of Springsteen songs that I, I, I'm just allergic to. So I went into Tunnel of Love having not liked an album from that man, having listened to the two albums from him I have heard hyped up the most. And I didn't love Tunnel of Love, but I did quite enjoy it. That is... Um, Fucking bizarre, honestly. I won't front. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, um, 
I'm not going to act like this is my favorite record of all time, but this has the vast majority of the songs I've really enjoyed from Bruce. Um, I I love I love the song Cautious Man. It's just kind of heartbreaking in a way I really respond to. Um, you've all dumped on spare parts, but um, I enjoyed that quite a bit. I I had no real deep thoughts on it, but I enjoyed it. Um, I have no notes and a thumbs down symbol next to Walk Like a Man, and I can't remember anything about it. So I'm just going to take my past self's word that that song was bad. Um, Your past self is very correct. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and I enjoyed the title track a lot. Um, it's very interesting to me. This album was called Tunnel of Love because that, for some an authentic kind of breakup record that is an image that's so like it, crass and youthful it reminds it, it like reminds me of like what the lower moments of American graffiti might be that's what that title evokes um, <laughs> um, so I don't get why you would call this quite authentic sad breakup record because it's quite a crass image. Um, this like kissing tunnel it's a, under a bridge. It's a stupid title. <laughs> um, the song itself is quite good. Um, and I think ultimately the reason I responded to this more is that it is Bruce at one of his lower moments. Um, it, this is not an album made by the king. This is an album made by, I mean, not a perfect equivalent, but like Bruce's version of the King Lear, you know, like uh, the fallen greatness. Um, and, and it just has a sense of palpable fallenness to it that I really respond to. Um, if for me, I have a problem with Bruce's attitude because I think rock is the genre of, of, of the disempowered. And whenever someone tries to really hype themselves up with music and I, I feel like there is a a vibe that is pleased with yourself coming through in rock music I tend to turn off from that and this is a record that is totally la not totally but largely lacking that vibe um, this is not an album made by someone who's pleased with themselves it's not an album made by someone who thinks they are the king of rock it's an album made by someone who is hurting and, and I feel it um, that being said, a lot of the albums are re a lot, sorry, a lot of the songs are really mid. A lot of the songs are less well written than other songs I have disliked just because of the vibe. Even if I like the vibe here more, the songwriting isn't as good, if that makes sense. No, it does. Um, so I like this album more. I don't love it, but I, I, have more respect for this album. I, I I would not have pegged that, but you know what? That's that is a really interesting perspective. No. Also, <laughs> if, you, if you ever try another Springsteen album, God help you if you didn't like Nebraska. But if you if you had to pick one, Darkness on the Edge of Town. Like, yeah, I was gonna say Darkness on, yeah. the, Edge Darkness of on the Edge of Town. Sounds like it's gonna be the one because uh, that that is a that is a very folk heavy album that is mainly about pain and sorrow and feeling like shit. Also, it, Bruce Bruce looks really hot on the cover. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, know really hot. I know Tyler Core human being, uh, Tim Heidecker said the same thing. <laughs> there you go. From the yeah, fucking yeah, horse's yeah. mouth. I mean, the Brian De Palma I mean, video for Dancing in the Dark. Who knows? Uh, like, did, wait, did boy. Brian De Palma direct that? He did. Yeah, he directed he did. the music video. Oh, what a king. Anyway. Yeah, right? um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so every Bruce album I've listened to so far, there are songs I've taken away as great. So I, I will never again really shit on the guy, but I probably, I don't see myself loving him. No. Um, that being said, I'm not surprised that Nebraska is demo tapes because it's mixed like ass. Um, yeah, totally. 
Ah, oh, look, everything you've said about Just why you know. why you don't care for a Nebraska is why I love it. So Exactly. <laughs> One of my agree, favorite fully. albums of all time. Yeah. I mean, it's but, just, why all of that reverb, Bruce? It just, why? You don't need it. Love it. Maloneliness. Love it. it, yep. it ma hauntingness. I'm glad you all have Nebraska. I, I'm glad that album exists. It clearly means a lot to all of you. I just don't love it. That's fair. No, enough. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Is everyone, has everyone said their piece on Tunnel of Love? Yeah. I believe yeah. we shared our sentiment I mean, about the album, by the way. I'm glad you can all understand now why I wanted to keep Stum on this um, hmm. and not really share my opinion, because I thought it would be surprising. It's nice. No, you, uh, yeah, it is. Genuine. you genuinely, it's not quite as surprising as the Kyle Kraft rating. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, I, you did pull the rug out from us. I, I will say that, that knowing so she didn't care for Nebraska and born in the USA, I didn't think she would dislike this more. But I didn't predict. And I didn't predict a significant level of more enjoyment. So this that, is her most wild card moment, truly. It, it truly is. It's a very hot take for the ages. Thank you. <laughs> but I also think it's kind of fashionable as well. Like a lot of people are coming back and saying, yeah, I actually, mean, it, like now, that, now that you've said it, it makes total sense to me. Yeah. All right, yeah. No. It, it's, it's kind of much like, a cool, uh, cool kid yeah. Springsteen take. <laughs> it's a, it's as I like to think of it, like predictable unpredictability. Yeah. In mm. the sense that, in the moment you don't get it, but afterwards you're like, damn, I should have gotten that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, favorite tracks and ratings. Yep. Uh, I'll go first since since uh, since for yeah. no reason whatsoever. Do it. Do it. <laughs> um, go fucking go it. So my three favorite tracks are uh, one more try easily. The like I said, one of the best songs Bruce Springsteen has ever done. One step um, up, you mean? <laughs> what did I say? One more try. One more try. Like it's a daft <laughs> from the song. One more one try. More try. <laughs> Even though that's one more time, but literally one get... of my favorite songs ever, and I didn't even get the fucking name of it right. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking of? It's called One More Try. Anyway, uh, one more, one, one step up, uh, one step up, two steps back. Um, what else? Uh, oh yeah, Brilliant Disguise and Tunnel of Love, easy top three. Um, and least favorite is Two Hands, and I'm gonna give this album a 6.5 out of 10. <laughs> Tyler stealing my role of the guy who says all the wrong things is really making me happy today. We love to yeah. see it. Anyway, oh. um, I believe in the acronym, that's me next. Um, I, I want to shout out Cautious Man, Tunnel of Love. And... I want to shout at that song. <laughs> Be a better song. Spare a part. <laughs> oh, shit. And Walk Like a Man is my least favorite. Not shocking at all. Mm hmm. That, the that's on get... brand. <laughs> okay, I'm glad that's on brand because I remember nothing about the song. Um, but anyway, I'm giving it a six. Yeah, and Morgan give also it? gives it a six, by the yes. way. That's true. I would give it a 6.5. Oh, okay. What are your favorite tracks, um, August? I don't know. You, you pretty much said them. Uh, oh. One Step, uh, Brilliant Disguise, and throwing. I mean, I could throw in Title or Tunnel of Love. And, wait, no, that is the say, title track. That is, that, is that, that is precisely what I'm thinking of. And I will go with the uh, the first track. I can't remember what that dumb song is Ain't called. Ain't Got You. Ain't Got You. And I would give this album a solid, despite my criticisms, I do still think it's a, it's a record that has enough good points for me to overall enjoy it. So six out of 10. Nice. Well, in, in the spirit of everybody on this fucking podcast pretty much agreeing and having the <laughs> same fucking opinion, my favorite tracks are Brilliant Disguise, One Step Up, and I'll be, I'll throw in a wild card and say Valentine's Day. 
Um, wow. Least favorite is it's either Ain't Got You or Tougher Than the Rest. I, I don't like either song. And uh, yeah, I give it a, a light six out of ten. Which makes wow. this our uh, most agree, agreed upon yep. review ever. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to the, the standard events. deviation, as in the average difference, is 0.2. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. Well, I, I yeah, find that it, coming. It's so not... funny how, despite us all agreeing, this has been like such a chaotic review. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Well, um, next week it's Morgan's recommendation, but he isn't here. Yes, so but it's a record that means it more... means a lot to uh, all of us. So uh, absolutely. Most so of if us, anyone wants to just hopefully save, all of us. If whoever feels oh, yeah. most qualified wants to talk about what we're talking about next week, well, I'll do ahead. it just because I'm the one who introduced it to Morgan, uh, which we'll, we'll have an anecdote about that. But we're doing uh, Go Farther in Lightness by Gang of Youths, um, which is what well, was an sort of indie rock favorite the year it came out, but is a criminally under discussed record these days. Mm-hmm. Like, I have not heard anybody mention it since it yeah. came out well, and it I is it one of like on, i watched it based on all of your recommendations yeah. um after we started the podcast when the last couple mm-hmm. of months um and like i'm shocked that i don't hear this record talked about outside of us it's very it's an amazing album it's in my top 10 of all time it's an ambitious record it's a record that bristles with ideas with energy, with effervescence, uh, uh, catchiness, and passion. Yeah, it's just a record mm-hmm. that is an absolute blast to listen to. So I hope that if anyone is watching who hasn't seen it, goes and gives it a shot. It's Absolutely. a long record, but it will reward your patience. Um, it's Morgan's and, favorite record yeah. of all time right now, yeah. I believe. Yeah, and yeah. it's one of like, Tyler's and one of mine. Yeah, I generally think this record has a chance to... to this launch Tallahassee as our highest rated recommended album. It's, it definitely even, has a chance. Even if August doesn't care for it and like I'm not holding my breath, I, I never no. would have thought it would be for him, but maybe he'll like it. We'll see. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of passion sh- um, and, yeah. and, and, and uh, positive Look, feelings. I, um, yeah. We'll need, we'll need that to bounce back considering chance. the next two I, albums we're covering. Speaking of the next two albums we're covering, we're talking about oh, the God. new Taylor Swift record, Folklore. Folklore and the we all wanted Logic. Taylor Swift to transition into folk music. And the last Logic album, No Pressure. This is going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Uh, Tune oh in next God. week it's to watch our, me um, suffer. I mean, just episode. pain. It's, it's pain. nothing but pain. pain. The pain. thumbnail Tune for that episode week. is just going to be the word pain. It, that's going to be the horse looking at the yeah. sea. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to remember that. Just tune, yeah. in, just tune in to watch me be sad. That's Yeah, pretty mm-hmm. much. I mean, we can celebrate the last Logic album being the last Logic album. So, But also... The supposedly. Look, no. I, I... I... I absolutely don't know i absolutely don't believe this is gonna be his last album ever i mean maybe it'll be his last for five six years but I you're gonna I, say I, five or six months <laughs> and we'll be that to review the next one yeah <laughs> so in closing rock over london <laughs> rock on chicago rock on chicago uh nike just do it yeah <laughs>